the 90s were a difficult time for the country and its people. Hell, it wasn't just the time period, it was the 90s. The phenomenon that will forever be remembered as one of the most difficult periods of the 20th century in Russian history, right after the October Revolution, the purges of 1937 and World War II. The Soviet Union had just collapsed and the new government didn't know exactly what to do. Factories that for generations were supported by the state started to close and millions of people suddenly found themselves jobless. The seemingly impervious moral standards of the Soviet man crumbled with an unexpected ease almost overnight and the crime rate skyrocketed. It was a difficult time, but it was also the time of opportunities. Those who capitalized on the newly discovered free market prospects the best are now at the top of the Forbes charts. Those who decided to stay honest people embraced the free market at the face value and tried to ride the wave starting new businesses. Many more remained ordinary workers, not willing to take any risks and simply thankful to have a job. And then there were us. The bandits, the mafia, Bratva or the brotherhood. It was easy money and that alone was enough to make people join. Why slave off for a man who'd pay you pennies if you could just make a monthly visit to him along with a few of your bros and make him pay you 10 times more? Threaten his wife or daughter, kick his employee's teeth out, pour gasoline all over his table and his fancy new suit and he would quickly find himself willing to negotiate a deal. It wasn't just robbery, no, it was a bit more complex than that. By entering a deal with us, the man was also paying us for the lack of problems, both from us and other gangs. Some businessmen were even glad to have us on their side, claiming that we were, quote, easier to figure out than the new taxes. Of course, it wasn't always easy for both parties. Sometimes some rivaling or up and coming gangs would ruin our man's store or set his car on fire. This was their way to challenge us for the territory, and to keep our meal ticket, we had to fight back. Sometimes they challenge us directly, shooting up someone's house or a car in the middle of the day. And sometimes, if the meal ticket was big enough, he could even order us out, turn to us if they wanted to settle their problems with their competitors. That was one of the few rare instances where we'd have to resort to things like kidnappings and torture. Usually, it was easy. Grab their relative at a bus stop, shove them into a car for a long silent ride around the city, let them go, and they would probably take the hint. If not, we'd have to resort to the more drastic measures, like arson and other forms of vandalism. If even that wouldn't work, then that was the time for a more close-up chat. A chat with hammers, shears, pliers, and torches. One of our meal tickets wanted some particular information beaten out of an acquaintance of his. I wasn't told what exactly he needed to say, but I wasn't there to know that. I was more of an escort to the negotiation place, which was an old abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of the city, a place where no one could hear your cries. Finding out where he lived was a trivial matter of bribing a familiar police officer who provided us with a man's whereabouts by the end of the day. When the night fell upon the city, me and three others jumped in the car and made our way to the man's street. We had a dusk bag, ropes, and a baseball bat for each of us, so we expected to easily persuade him to join us for a ride in the trunk. Many people would start spilling their beans as soon as they would see us approach, but we knew that if we wanted him to tell us everything, we had to take him with us. We parked our car not far away from his house and started waiting. The plan was to catch him on his way home from work, and after an hour or so of waiting, we noticed a man matching the description we were given. I remember that upon seeing him, I immediately started having second thoughts about our endeavor. The man was almost two meters tall, and although he was not a bodybuilder, you could almost see his muscles bulge through his clothes. He walked the streets with confidence that even I could envy, and his eyes were burning with ire like rubies. My initial thought was to come back later with more people. However, one of the guys already jumped out of the car and started to run in the direction of the man 
swinging his bat. Not to be outdone, we followed. The first hit of a bat landed on his raised forearm. The man didn't even take a step back, instead facing the attack head on. Despite my worries, his muscles were no match for a weapon, and I saw him silently wince as the wood cracked his bones. The second hit from one of the guys who ran over landed on the man's knee. I was confident that I heard the bones crack. The man kneeled with a soft sigh and rose his hand to stop the next attack. Bad idea. With a refined movement, my bat grazed across his fingers, bending them backward. Someone kicked his other leg and the man fell to the ground. I'd seen it a hundred times before. When surrounded on the ground, people would usually assume the fetal position and cover their head. But instead, the man was not giving up to stand up. The four of us surrounded him and started kicking and stomping. We knew exactly where to hit to make it count while making sure the man would survive. Lower back, stomach, ankles, fingers, teeth, eye sockets, all vulnerable areas that were easily hurt. And yet, despite us stomping his fingers and kicking his elbows, the man was still trying to get up, not bothering to guard even once. We were kicking him for two minutes straight until finally he physically couldn't move anymore. By tomorrow, his arms would probably turn purple from all the bruises on them. When we were sure that he wouldn't be able to move anymore, we tied him up, put a bag over his head and threw him in the trunk. While we were doing all that, I took a glance at his face. A few of his teeth were missing, his nose and lips were squashed and his eyes had bruises around them. By the time we'd get him to the warehouse, they would probably start swelling, making it hard for him to see. After shoving him into the car, we proceeded to the warehouse on the outskirts of the city, where the others had already been waiting for us, and among them, Igor, the surgeon. He didn't have a medical education, but you can guess why everyone called him that. We pulled up to the warehouse, pulled the man out of the trunk, and pulled him towards the warehouse. Despite the heavy injuries, he started resisting, almost breaking free at some point, and landing a hit on my pal Roman with his elbow. And so we took another two minutes to explain to him why it was a bad idea to struggle. You stubborn son of a... Roman was kicking him with vengeance, stopping only to wipe off the blood that was dripping from his split eyebrow. When will you learn your place? After we were done with him, I was scared that we might have killed him. But just a few seconds after we'd stopped, he started moving again. Wondering where he was getting that much strength, we picked him up and brought him inside the warehouse, where we tied him to the chair. Look at that, Roman exclaimed, pulling something out from underneath the stranger's clothes. A massive golden cross on a similarly massive chain to match. Our guy sure is religious. The man jerked in place, trying to resist, to stop Roman from taking his cross away, and I felt a bit of respect well up within me. The man was not just submitting, he was also trying to protect the symbol of his faith. Let him be, Roman, I told him. Leave the cross alone, that's not very Christian of you. What we had done and what we were going to do to the man wasn't very Christian either, but that was different. Beating up a man to within an inch of his life was personal, a small transgression of the commandments, but taking away his cross, that was sacrilege. All right, all right, Roman stepped away from him, but if he kicks it, I'm taking it, you hear that? The man didn't reply. As usual, he remained silent. I suddenly felt intimidated by that bound and broken figure. We had been beating him senselessly, kidnapping him, bound him, put a bag over his head. Yet, he remained stoic. Not a single word fell from his lips, not a single plea or cry of pain. Let's step outside for a smoke, I told Roman. The surgeon should be here soon. Yeah, let's go, Roman agreed. You two. Keep an eye on him, okay? He told the two other thugs. We'll be back soon. 
What a strange fella, Roman said when we stepped outside. All that beating, not a word, he said. Do you think the surgeon will be able to make him talk? I asked. Oh yeah, Roman nodded. That man can make anyone sing. Roman winced and shook his leg. I think I broke a toe while I was kicking him. Heads up, I told him, throwing a cigarette away when I noticed the familiar car pull up. The surgeon always knew how to make an impression. He was a professional. And back then, every pro worth his salt knew that to elevate yourself above the rest of the amateurs, simply having special skills weren't enough. You also had to make a lasting impression on the people around you. He appeared out of his car, dressed as always, shoes polished so tediously you could see the stars above reflecting them, a long coat he carelessly wore on his shoulders, and a three-piece suit underneath without a single fold on it, and a long silk scarf hanging down almost to his knees. A perfect gangster who just stepped down from the silver screen to teach you how it's done. And the thing he always carried in his leather gloves, an ugly dirty, angular thing that didn't match the rest of his looks at all. A toolbox, the same one you'd see any plumber carry around. I looked away when my eyes crossed his. I couldn't endure his gaze. Cold, sharp and lifeless, like some of the instruments he was using. Evening, he greeted us, wrinkling his nose and waving the cigarette smoke away. The client is in the warehouse, I presume? Hey, surgeon. Roman greeted him. Yeah, he's in there waiting for you. Did you warm him up for me? The surgeon asked. Yeah, we worked quite a number on that one, Roman said. I can tell you, that guy can take quite a beating. We've crushed his face into a mush to bring him here. Quite a stubborn one. Really? The surgeon got a little bit excited and his smirk made my skin crawl. Well then, I better not waste any time and get right to it. If he is as stubborn as you say he is, well, we might have a long night ahead of us. He didn't say those last words as a man who dreaded working long hours. On the contrary, he was looking forward to it. He walked past us and entered the warehouse, did you see how worked up he got when he heard that the guy won't talk easily? I asked Roman. Gives me conniptions. No doubt he looks forward to torturing the whole night. We shouldn't have agreed to work with him. If the man is smart, he'll spill the beans soon, Roman said. So, it's up to him. Nobody will torture him just for the sake of it. I doubt that, I told Roman. That surgeon looks like a guy who tormented cats when he was a kid. A moment later, the surgeon exited the warehouse. He seemed furious. Is this some kind of joke? He asked us. Ease up, man. What are you talking about? I asked him. I was not keen on his tone. You said you beat him up already, but he doesn't have a single bruise on him. The surgeon exclaimed. Roman and I looked at each other. We had clearly seen the man's face. There was no way the surgeon could have missed any of those. Did you take off his hood? Roman asked him. Do I look stupid to you? The surgeon exclaimed. Of course I took off the hood. You said the guy's face was a mush. We looked at each other again. Something wasn't right. We hurried inside. The man was still bound to his chair, so there was no mistake about it. His hood was taken off and Roman and I didn't need to get close. His face, while covered in dried up blood, was indeed perfectly fine. What the hell? Roman exclaimed. He came over closer and leaned in to take a better look. He really is fine, he shouted to me. No bruises, no scars, nothing. No way, I said, coming closer. I grabbed his jaw and forcefully opened the man's mouth. He tried to bite me, and I had to yank my arm away. But when his teeth snapped at where my fingers had been just a second before, I saw that all of them were miraculously intact. I clearly remembered kicking one of his molars out, 
clearly remembered seeing the broken fences of his teeth under his swollen lips when I was putting a hood over his head. This meant that somehow, the man regenerated all of his wounds and his teeth in a span of one hour. He had no teeth before, I told the surgeon. He has them now, I don't know how, but he grew them back already. Really? I could hear that he was not convinced. I heard the clanking of his toolbox as he hastily opened it. Well then, you two won't mind if I test that theory. He walked over to the man with a hammer and pliers in his hands. Pushing the man's head back, he shoved the hammer into his mouth to pry it open and brought his pliers closer. I looked away, with a horrible screeching sound of pliers metal scratching against the man's enamel. The cracking sound the bone made when snapped still made me shudder. Quite a champ, I heard the surgeon say with awe in his voice. Didn't even wince. We'll get along fine. And what now? Roman asked him. And now? We wait. The surgeon answered. He pointed at Roman with the pliers, which still had a piece of tooth squeezed between them. And if he doesn't miraculously grow his tooth back in 30 minutes, I'm going to be very disappointed that you've wasted my time. Fine, Roman said with bravado, although I could see that he was a bit shaken. If that's what you want, then we'll wait. But I'm telling you, we beat him up good. 30 minutes went by agonizingly slow. I knew that we were telling the surgeon the truth, but I didn't want to argue with him about that. Suppose the man wouldn't grow his tooth back in 30 minutes. Then what? Sure, the surgeon wouldn't be able to do us any harm. There were four of us and one of him. But he had a lot of clout with our boss. He could create some problems for us. Him saying that we weren't respecting him would suffice to do that. Respect meant a lot in the 90s. It was the only stable national currency back then. Well, time's up, the surgeon proclaimed, walking over to the man. He grabbed his hammer and lifted it, as if getting ready to bring it down on the man's head. But the man just smiled and opened his mouth. The tooth was back there, white and shiny, without even a scratch. Interesting, the surgeon purred. So, you're like that, huh? He took his toolbox and brought it closer to the man so that he could see its contents. What these amateurs have pulled you through is nothing when compared to what I'm going to do to you, he said kneeling near the box. If you think that your miracle powers are going to save you, you're gravely mistaken. He pulled out a few instruments, a pair of shears, a saw, a power drill. These are just the warm-up, he assured the man. Do you want to see the main dish? The man spat in the surgeon's face. The surgeon calmly took out a handkerchief and wiped the saliva off his face. Okay, he said in a calm voice. Main dish it is. His breathing got faster. I could see that he was excited to begin. To him, the man was a canvas which could never be finished. A meal which couldn't be fully consumed. He could get wild with him. And most importantly, he could forget about the restraint. The surgeon pulled out a gas torch and lit it up. Let's see if you feel any pain, he said, pointing it at the man's golden cross. The fire didn't hit the cross accurately, scorching a bit of skin underneath. The man started breathing from pain, trying to break his restraints, and still not a sound came out of his mouth. Good, the surgeon said. Then we speak the same language. I didn't want to look at it. Giving Roman a sigh, I stepped outside. The rest of the gang followed leaving the surgeon alone with his prey. The next few hours seemed like a nightmare. None of us dared to enter the warehouse, as just the sounds alone, amplified by the warehouse's emptiness, were gut-wrenching. 
the sounds of flesh tearing, the sound a saw makes when its metal teeth scratches against the bone, the wet, squishing sound the hammer makes when it hits meat. Sergei, one of us four, tried to enter once to see how it was going. The moment he opened the door and looked inside, he, the man who once dragged a man behind his car for two kilometers, threw up onto the ground in disgust. Whatever was going on inside was too much for him to bear. Yet, throughout all of that, the only sound coming from inside we could hear was the surgeon's. His screams of frustration and exhaustion. By the end of the third hour, he'd finally gone silent. There was only silence inside. We feared that the silent man could break out of his restraints and attack the surgeon. Frankly, at that point, we didn't know what he'd do if that were the case. We couldn't even imagine of subduing him again. Nevertheless, I volunteered to take a look inside. When I stepped inside the building, I understood why Sergei couldn't keep himself together. The floor, in a radius of three meters around the bound man, was flooded with blood. Here and there, I could see bits of flesh and cloth scattered around. The stench of scorched meat and the smell of iron lingering in the air was almost unbearable. The surgeon was sitting in the pool of blood, heavily panting. He didn't look very excited anymore. In his hand, he was holding a hammer. I noticed that his palms had fresh blisters on them. The man's entire body was red from the blood he'd lost. Only the whites of his eyes were standing out. But I could see that underneath all that blood, he was fine. He was also smirking. This freak grows skin back when I'm not looking, the surgeon said, exhausted. I pull it off, throw it into the bucket, and when I look back, he's already fine. Do you want to look at the bucket? He asked me suddenly. It's almost full. I'm good, I believe you, I told him. Do you have a cigarette? He asked me. I thought you don't smoke, I wondered. Just give me the damn cigarette. He shouted so hard the windows of the warehouse trembled. Okay, here you go, I said when the echo finally subsided. I carefully handed him a cigarette and matches, trying not to step into the blood and stepped away. The surgeon lit it up and took a deep hit. I'm not done with you, he threatened the bound man, pointing at him with his cigarette. You will talk. You'll talk so loud, the whole of Moscow is going to hear you. He jumped to his feet and headed outside. Too worried to leave the man alone, I stayed inside. A minute later, he came back, carrying a canister of gasoline with him. Now, hold on a second, I exclaimed, seeing where it was heading. What do you think you're doing? Just stand by and watch, the surgeon said, coming over to the blooded man. I'll make him talk. You'll see. We're supposed to keep him alive, I shouted at him. Oh, he'll be alive all right, the surgeon promised me. Alive and talking. He started pouring the gasoline over the man's body, the flammable fluid washing away the blood. In some 15 seconds, the man was practically drenched in it. Here we go. The surgeon smiled and lit up a match. Just so you know, he told the man, I heard that when you're burning, the air boils in your lungs. With that, he threw the match at the man. His entire body went up in flames instantly. I saw his skin bubbling as the flames were vaporizing it and looked away. A moment later, I heard a previously unheard sound. The grunts of pain. The surgeon's plan worked. The man was finally showing the signs of feeling pain. He was finally subsiding to the torture. I told you I'd make you talk, the surgeon victoriously exclaimed. Burn, he shouted as he raised his hands up. But in his frenzy to make the man feel pain, in his struggle against this indomitable will, 
the surgeon made one miscalculation. I was concerned that the rope would burn up and break, but it would actually take a few minutes for that to happen. I'm sure the surgeon knew about that as well. What he forgot about was that the skin, once scorched to such a degree, becomes soft, malleable, it barely stays in place, and it comes off easily. The man suddenly sprung to his feet, pulling his hands which were tied behind his back upwards. With a quick motion, the skin of his hands, struggling against the ropes on the wrist, came off like gloves. Next were the ropes on his legs. With his now free hands, he yanked his left leg out of the ropes, which bound it to the chair, making the skin slow off in the process. Then he repeated the same with the other leg. We couldn't stop him. We couldn't even come closer to him. Throughout all of that, he was still burning and screaming. But as the man finally freed himself, his screams shifted in tone, becoming a victorious one. Still grunting in pain, the man hobbled toward the surgeon who was in shock from what he was seeing. How are you still alive? was all the surgeon could ask before the man grabbed him by the throat. For the first time in the evening, the man spoke. His lips were charred and his throat was burned by the hot air. Yet his voice sounded victorious and imposing. My body is as strong as this cross he told the surgeon, and my cross is as strong as my faith. He grabbed the man in a bear hug. The surgeon screamed when the fire started licking his cheeks and ears. Are you God-fearing? The man hollered. The surgeon didn't answer. He was just screaming. I heard Roman and the rest of the gang come inside the warehouse None of them made a move towards the man. At that point, we doubted that there was anything we could do. We just watched as the surgeon was dying in the man's embrace, consumed by the fire he himself started. A few minutes later, when the fire finally went out, the man dropped the surgeon's burned body to the ground. He gave us one look, one look full of pain and unimaginable anger full of that ire I first noted when I first saw him. And we ran away. His skin was almost completely gone, and even some of his muscles were visibly damaged by the fire. Yet we knew that wasn't a fight we could win. We jumped inside our car and floored it. We drove all the way from Moscow to St. Petersburg that night, staying at one of the hotels near the road. The evening of that night made all of us quit. All except Roman. He was found scorched inside his car three months later. While the police thought that it was an attack of a competing gang, the three of us knew that wasn't the case. We knew that Roman alone was struck down by the righteous fury of a man whose faith alone kept him alive no matter what the righteous fury of a man whose cross he wanted to take away. I've never met that man again. Perhaps it was because I've decided to repent and lead a more honest life. I've worked at the factory for a few years, and when things started to look up, I even started my own business with the money I've saved up from my previous, less honest life. But yesterday, I saw that man again, not on the street, no. Those eyes, full of ire, looked into mine from the screen of my computer. It was that mad look I recognised. Not even the face. No, he shaved the beard since that time he was photographed. But the eyes. The eyes stayed the same. The eyes that stare at you with anger and contempt. The eyes of a man who's lived through all of the hardships of the last century clinging to his faith alone. The eyes of the man whom so many have tried to kill. Yet none of them succeeded.
in a small town. Small, as in barely over a thousand people living there. A new building is something that rarely, if ever, gets built. More than likely, if a new business is started or coming to the town, they'll buy an abandoned building and renovate it instead of having to purchase land and build from the literal ground up. The residents of the town usually are perfectly happy with that because it helps keep their town small and secluded and helps local building contractors like my father keep in business. So, when a rich couple that moved from the city settled in our town and wanted to open a new restaurant last summer, they opted to convert an old pier storehouse that sat upon the river which flowed through our town. And to show solidarity with our town and support local business, they hired my father's company to oversee the construction. My father's construction business wasn't very large at all. It was just him, me, Steve and Walter. We are all sort of jack of all trades kind of guys. However, there are a couple of guys in town that are very skilled in specific trades that were always willing to help my father at the drop of a hat if need be. With a crew like this, and a very customer friendly atmosphere, combined with an incredible work ethic and high standards, mostly everyone in the whole county called my father's business when they needed work to be done. And the newcomers were no exception. Apparently they'd done their research before they even moved from the city. The pier storehouse we were tasked into converting to a restaurant had a bit of a history in the town. At one point in the past, money flowed like water through the place due to its location on the river. Then one day, too far back in history that anyone living knows the real reason, the whole pier was abandoned. Boats no longer stopped there and some sort of dark aura seemed to emanate from the place. The town suffered immensely from the loss of income, but we are hardy people and survived. We turned the place into the sleepy little town that it is today and has been for probably over 150 years. Today, the townsfolk still avoid the pier, but not because of a shady past or bad feeling coming from the place. The whole thing is ancient, and no repairs have been done in a long, long time. It's an unsafe place to be. Even putting a single foot on a rotting wood could have you falling through. Kids sometimes go to it at night and drink and smoke pot. I know I did. But besides that, the place is devoid of human activity or life. Even fishermen prefer to cast their rods from the riverbank rather than take a step under the pier. This couple had really, really deep pockets however, and the money that was offered to my father's business was too much to turn down. So, on the first day of June, in the pale light of early morning, I went with my father to survey the pier to see what exactly we needed to do. The place was large, stretching about 50 feet from the shoreline and about 400 feet long, with the storehouse smack dab in the middle of it. Our employers didn't want us to replace the pier or anything that large in scale, just repair and update the storehouse and enough of the pier so that people could walk to and from the soon to be restaurant without fear of falling through rotting wooden planks. We still had our work cut out for us, but it wasn't going to be an impossible task. Clicking on our headlamps, my father told me he wanted me to check out the storehouse while he checked the pier itself, both the top and bottom. I had no desire to climb underneath the old structure and wade around in the water, so I happily agreed. Grabbing a notebook, pencil, multi-tool, respirator and measuring tape, I made my way cautiously over to the storehouse. While I'd been up to the storehouse before, when I was a teenager looking for a hidden spot to smoke a joint, I did weigh a bit more than I did at 14, and each creak of the wood below my feet caused me to wince in anticipation of me crashing through into the water 15 feet below. However, I made it up to the storehouse without incident, and while I was relieved, I didn't drop my guard for an instant. As I said earlier, I'd been up to the storehouse before, but it was always at night, and I always just used it as a view obscura while I smoked a joint or drank some beer. This was the first time I got to actually look over the structure, and I have to admit that whoever built it was a very skilled carpenter. 
even with age, its location near the water, and the many times it had to deal with harsh weather throughout the years, it stood proud and intact. Sure, whatever paint had been on it had eroded before I was even born, and the sign up of the doorway had been eroded so much that any writing on it had disappeared. But what could you expect? A wooden building that was 100 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 15 feet tall was over 100 years old, still standing and having no structural issues was impressive. There was one thing that puzzled me, however. There were two entrances into the storehouse, one facing the shore and one facing the river. With modern building codes, we would have to build in at least two more exits, but that wasn't the strange thing. Each doorway had a chain that crossed it multiple times. The chains were attached to stakes driven into the wood besides the doorway, leaving no way to dislodge the chains except by removing the stakes from the wood. Looking closer at the chains, I noticed another odd aspect of them. I was expecting rusted iron chains, but the metal was blackened instead. Not what a normal rusted iron looks like. Thinking it over for a moment, I realized that the chains weren't rusted, but tarnished. These chains were made of silver. I called my father over, who had been slowly looking over the planks on top of the pier to measure out how much we needed to replace. He made his way over, and I showed him the chains on the door facing the shore. My father looked over the silver links and whistled. Quite a find you got yourself there. We can bring them back to the shop, melt them down, and we'll make ourselves a pretty penny before the first payment gets to the bank account. He patted my shoulder and smiled. I doubt the millers have seen this place in person yet, much less know the precious metal just hanging around for the taking. Now, I wasn't a superstitious man, and neither was anyone in my family, nor anyone I knew. But a little warning flag was going off in my head. Why do you think these chains are made of silver? Wouldn't regular iron chains be stronger and way less expensive? The smile vanished from my father's face as he thought a moment. Maybe it has something to do with why the pier closed all those years ago. People were a lot more superstitious back then, so it probably has to do with that. I frowned, knowing his explanation was more than likely right. But something still bothered me. Yeah, that's true. But still, silver chains seem a little bit... excessive, if you know what I mean. Isn't silver used to ward off evil or something like that? The smile returned to my father's face. What, you think a werewolf or something is living in there? Come on, Caleb. You came down here to smoke and drink when you were in high school. I came down here to do the same, and I'm pretty sure your grandfather did the same. Out of all those times, did you feel something evil down here? Because I'll tell you, I sure as hell haven't. I have to admit that I hadn't. The plenty of times that I'd come down here, the situation seemed straight out of a horror movie, yet nothing had happened. I never felt sinister eyes watching me, or heard growls or whispers, or smelt death and decay or anything like that. My father turned and started walking back to where he'd left off. Just take those chains off for today. We'll worry about the other door's chain some other day. Maybe we'll even get luckier and find something better in the storehouse. I nodded and turned my attention back to the stakes, buried into the wood and holding the silver links barricade in place. I went back to the truck we'd come in and grabbed a pry bar. It didn't take much effort to pry off the three stakes on the left side of the doorway, causing the chains to fall loosely to the right side and enabling the door to be opened inward. Putting on my respirator, I took note of the door's high quality craftsmanship and made a note in my notebook that the employers might want to keep the door for aesthetic taste. Slipping the pry bar into my tool belt, I gripped the doorknob and opened the door. A loud creaking accompanied the first sunlight that had entered the storehouse in over a century. I had always wondered why this building never had windows, but I guessed if you were keeping trading goods in there, you wouldn't want an easy way for thieves to enter. I entered the ancient structure and took a look around. To my surprise, 
The place was stacked high with old shipping crates and wooden barrels. The place had been abandoned with a ton of goods in it. I was also thankful for my respirator. And there were layers upon layers of dust everywhere. And who knew what kind of mold and mildew was growing there as well. It was quite the sight to see. And I felt a sort of childlike giddiness that I was the first person to explore this town staple since its doors had been chained shut over 150 years ago. I closed the door behind me and slowly began to walk around, the aisles made up by the stacked cargo. I was also very cautious, as not only the ancient cargo crates might fall apart at the slightest touch, but the floor was far more likely to collapse with all this added weight on it. Even though I knew I had a job to do, it was hard to contain my excitement at exploring the place. Every couple of steps, I would stop and take a look at the crates and barrels, trying to use my headlamp to see if any of them contained labels of any sort. I was pretty sure there wasn't any food in here, even if I couldn't smell anything through my respirator, because rotten food would have reached the outside by then, and standing near the door, I had smelt nothing. My curiosity soon turned to boredom as I moved around the storehouse. I knew I wasn't allowed to open any of the crates or barrels, and it seemed like there was nothing in here but crates and barrels. The novelty was wearing off quickly, and I disappointingly went about doing the job I was sent in here to do. I began taking measurements and looked for any major damage to the floor or structure we'd have to deal with before beginning the restoration process. My father's business had decent insurance, but so far, we'd only had to use it once for Walter. Father prided himself on safety and client satisfaction, and as much of a pain in the ass that was to uphold, it was worth it. I was bent over, looking at some potential water damage in a corner of the building, when a sudden creak made me stand up at attention. It hadn't sounded like a creak of a wood settling, but more of something pressing weight on something wooden. Was I not alone in this storehouse? Dad, are you in here? I called out in the respirator. I know my voice was muffled, but if he was in the storehouse, he should have heard me easily enough. I got no response back. I waited for a couple more seconds before deciding it must have just been wood naturally setting and went back to inspecting the corner. Another creak rang out sharply through the storehouse, and this time I stood back up and tried to look around with my headlamp. The sun was starting to rise outside, providing no light through the tiny openings in the wall and leaving me to rely on my headlamp to see anything. Dad, if that's you, this isn't funny. Just let me know if you're in here or not. I called out again, mostly anger in my voice, though I couldn't help but let a tiny bit of fear out as well. There was no possible way there could be anyone else here other than me and my father. A tiny voice suddenly spoke out in the back of my mind. There's a reason the people here chain the door shut with silver. I shook that thought out of my head, but decided I wasn't going to get spooked by my father. I reached into my tool belt and grabbed the pry bar. Dad, I'm warning you, I got my crowbar out, and if you scare me, I can't guarantee I won't whack you in the face with it. I called out again, only to hear nothing but silence in return. I knew then I wasn't going to let Dad make a fool out of me, and slowly began to search the storehouse for him. I felt a little exhilarated, stalking the aisles like a hunter in search of his prey. Dad rarely ever was the playful type, especially when it came to work, but I also knew he was an opportunist, and what better opportunity than this to scare your fully grown son and get a good laugh out of it. But I wasn't going to let him have his way in this maze of aged wood. I was going to teach him what a bad idea it was to try and scare a man who's got 5 inches and at least 25 more pounds of muscle on you. Of course, I wouldn't really hit him with a pry bar, but he didn't know that. As I got near another corner of the storehouse, I heard another creak. This one was much louder than before, but the sound made me freeze in place as I realized my mistake. The creak wasn't coming from the floor, like someone stepping on one of the old floorboards. The creak was coming from above. 
and was probably one of the many support beams over my head starting to give under pressure. I cursed my bad luck and frantically began to scan the ceiling, trying to see which beam was in danger of falling down and possibly bringing the whole ceiling down with it. Scanning the ceiling, the beam in question was easy to find, and what my headlamp illuminated made my blood run cold and the breath catch my throat. About 10 feet from me, laying across one of the thicker horizontal beams, was a creature. A monster I couldn't dream up of even in my worst nightmares. The body pale and shaped like a human, but must have been 7 feet long. Its skin was stretched tight across all the bones in its body, and black veins could be seen crisscrossing throughout it. Its feet were webbed, and the hands that topped each of its two long, spidery arms looked like two hands merged together. It was using two palms and ten fingers on each hand to keep itself steady on the beam. The head was the worst thing about it. Thin, long hair hung down the sides of its face. It had no nose, with its eye sockets taking up about two-thirds of its face and the rest of it being a long, thin jaw. Despite how large the sockets were, the eyes seemed to be just two small pinpricks of yellow light shining in through an abysmally dark cavern. Its mouth was open, and it had no teeth. A long, grey tongue, no shorter than two feet, hung from its mouth. But it wasn't an ordinary tongue. The end of the tongue opened up into another tiny mouth, this one filled with nothing but needle-like teeth. For a few seconds, we just stared at one another. This thing didn't move out of surprise of being caught, and I didn't move out of seeing some spawn from the pits of hell not more than ten feet away from me. At the end of those ten seconds, the tongue twitched towards me slightly, and by instinct, I threw the pry bar at the beast with all of my might, turning my heels and ran as fast as I could away. A sickening crunch told me that my pry bar had hit its mark, but I wasn't going to stop for anything. Unfortunately, in my panic, I tried to turn a corner too quick and ended up colliding into a stack of crates. These crates came crashing down on top of me, pinning me to the ground and cracking my respirator and destroying my headlamp. I laid there in the utter dark for a few moments, stunned. A dull ache began to spread across my head and chest. A sound behind me made adrenaline course through my veins and clear my foggy mind in an instant. Behind me was the unmistakable sound of the floorboards creaking, mixed in with heavy breathing. Strength and purpose surged through me, and I burst forth from the fallen crates like a bat out of hell. Though I didn't have a light to guide my way, I generally remembered where I'd entered from, and I charged in that direction as fast as I could. Many times, I ended up slamming hard into the shipping barrels and boxes, but survival instinct had kicked in, and I recovered from those impacts instantly. I also think I was screaming, but I'm not completely sure. I made it to the door, for I could feel the outline of it in the doorway, but to my horror, there was no handle on the inside. How could I have missed that? I began feeling around in vain, trying to find some opening I could fit my hand through and pull the thing open. When I found nothing, I tried pushing the door, but it wouldn't move an inch. From the darkness behind me, I heard a rapid squeaking on the floorboards as the thing began to run at me from the darkness. It must have known I was at the door and had no plans on letting me escape. All of a sudden, the door was pushed inward, knocking me on my butt. Light flooded inward and I could see the silhouette of my father standing in the doorway. What the hell's going on in here? He asked, but I didn't answer. I lunged for the open air, collapsing under the pier in the light of the morning sun and thanking God I'd made it out of there alive. My father knelt by my side, and I guess I was more banged up than I thought, because Dad went pale at the sight of me. Oh God, we have to get you to the hospital, now. He cried, wrapping one of my arms around his shoulder and lifting me from the ground. I didn't mind. I was just thankful to be in the light again. However, 
as he placed me in the passenger side of the truck and the world started fading fast as my eyes grew heavy. I noticed something in the rearview mirror that sent abject horror through my soul. The door to the storehouse was wide open. Before I could muster the strength to tell my father to close the door, I lost consciousness. I awoke in the hospital later. Apparently, I had a pretty nasty concussion and head wound from one of the old boxes falling on it. When I tried to tell the doctors, my father, anyone who would listen about the creature in the storehouse, I was told the head injury, like the one I got, could explain why I saw a monster in the storehouse. But I saw it before I was injured. I was scared to go home, and my fears were solidified when later that afternoon, Walter and Steve dropped by to drop off the broken respirator and pry bar they retrieved from the storehouse. They said they didn't find any monsters in there, but my respirator had been crushed completely, like someone stomped on it. And my pry bar had this black, sticky, viscous substance on one end. And they had no clue as to what it could be. I quit my father's business and moved downstate two weeks after the incident. On the surface, I told my dad that I was looking to expand my own horizons, and while I loved him, I needed a fresh change of pace. In truth, it was because I was afraid to be in my own hometown with that thing free. I don't know how old wood and chains managed to keep it locked in there for over a hundred years, but it had worked. And now that it was out, I feared what it would do with its newfound freedom. I'm working for another contracting company about 70 miles south. It's not as good as my job with my dad's company, but I get by. I occasionally check in with my family and everything seems to be going great. They finished remodeling the storehouse into a restaurant in the fall and it's a pretty popular place. Life is looking up for the town. Well, that was until the winter. Throughout the times I called during the summer and fall, I found out from my conversations with Dad that some of his fishermen friends had been complaining. It seemed that in the latest summer and fall that all the fish were disappearing from the river and nobody had a clue why. When I called in December, my decision to get as far away from that river as I could was reaffirmed. It seems like all the fish and three local fishermen were making up the disappeared list. Checking online recently, that number of missing men has only tripled since then, with a mother and a baby added in two. We should have brought that building down on that beast's head when we had the chance. When I was 13, the country I grew up in faced a month-long lockdown in the middle of winter. There was no viral outbreak, no toxic chemicals leaking from unfettered reactor cores. This was man-made, stemming from a threat of war by an immense foreign power. Television sets sang with patriotic jingles and presidential addresses, and the susurrus of hushed whispers blanketed cities and districts and neighborhoods like a shroud in the night. Where once winter was marked with festivities adorning every corner of the boulevard, it now cast a freezing breath over empty gardens, shuttered windows, and deserted streets. Hundreds of millions brought to a standstill, because two men couldn't agree on peace. My neighborhood was in a commonplace middle-income locality, with squat two-story houses peppered amidst high-rises and grey government quarters. The narrow streets traced their way through tight turnings and past unkempt old garages, littered with garbage from weeks of no maintenance. I remembered walking to school through those lanes when things were normal, and how the old kindergarten by the central square would loom up on me, yellow and red, plastered with paintings of old cartoons. Now everything looked the same, drab and dismal, alone and abandoned. On the first week of the lockdown, we had to make our scheduled trip to the ration store to get our weekly quota of rice and lentils. Four sets, one each for my mother, father, 
grandmother and I. It made for miserable meals and offered nothing sweet, but it was sustenance. I offered to go, but my father wouldn't let me. The authorities would only allow one family member from each household to purchase rations on specific days of the week, and he didn't want me to get questioned by the police if they stopped me. I protested, but he didn't cave. Instead, he put his hand on my shoulder and told me that later on, I would understand. My father is a stern yet amicable man who puts family over everything else. My relationship with him is rather informal. The kind where going out for dumplings at the local tea stall every week was considered routine instead of privilege. Tall and dark and imposing, but almost always friendly. So, when I heard the urgency in his voice, I believed that he truly meant it. The first two weeks passed without much incident. There were rumours of police violence across the city, of dissident and rebel hotspots past the river, and fewer and fewer people were risking going outside to purchase a drink from the local hoarder or a cigar from the tobacco magnate by the boulevard. The silence at night was heavier every day, as if we were being pushed down harder and harder to strangulate and suffocate our very wills. On the third week, my father was called away for what the government deemed essential work, supervising the city mills and searching for signs of sabotage. He knew I would have to bring in the rations now, so before he ventured out, he sat with me in the drawing room. Son, you already know the basics. Carry your papers, stand in the line, ask the policeman for help if someone tries to claim your share. Do not shout, do not run, do not talk back to the guards. I knew all of this. Don't worry, I reassured him. He sighed and leaned back against the wall, closing his eyes. The veins on his arms stood out as he squeezed his fist closed, tighter and tighter. When he spoke, his voice was markedly different. Okay, now I have to tell you the second set of rules. I raised an eyebrow at him. There's another set? Did the police make them? No, no, the police won't tell you this, but you need to listen. Your life and ours will depend on it. I was suddenly aware of the chill in the air, of the wind whistling through the windows and under the door. There are old lands, son, older than you know. There are things that live here that few will believe and fewer have seen. They only come out when it's quiet, when the drone of footsteps and the screech of tires come to a halt. You cannot reason with them, you cannot talk to them, and you certainly cannot comprehend them. They don't abide by our mortal rationality, nor by our laws. The wind seemed to cease, and I narrowed my eyes. This had to be a joke. Gallo's humour to cheer me up before I went outside. But my father has never been that kind of man. I know it sounds strange, but for my sake and yours, promise me you'll do this. I gulped and nodded. Good. Now, there's really only one thing I'd like you to do here. When you're returning with the rations, it'll be difficult for you to carry everything together. It's a week's supply and it's heavy, and a fair half an hour's walk from home. You'll want to rest a little, to put down the bags and catch your breath on the sidewalk, and that's fine. The only thing you must remember is never do it at a crossing. Never put the bag down and stop with the lanes opening up and heading away from you, all right? I nodded, digesting everything. I didn't understand what this would save me from, but I trusted my father. He wiped a bead of sweat from his forehead and held my face in his hands. Please remember this, please. Do not stop anywhere where there's a lane on your side. I gulped. Can you tell me more? I asked. He pushed himself back up, standing against the wall, packed trolley bags beside him, and helped me get to my feet. I will, son. Whatever my father knew, and his father before him. This isn't the first lockdown this city has ever had. There were others, bigger ones, over the last thousand years. This won't be the last time either. 
and there were times where there weren't as many people as there are today. This is history, and we must learn from it. With that, he was ushered away by the military, and I saw their rusted red jeep rumble down the road, leaving a wake of dust and discontent behind. I decided to go out two days after that to get the rations. The pink permission slip was tucked tightly into my pockets, and I carried a khaki bag to put most of the rice in. A week's worth of rations for one household of three wasn't going to fit otherwise. I set out at four in the afternoon, my allotted time, the freezing cold boring its way into my bones, making my teeth chatter and turning my breath to mist. The air smelt of dead leaves, and the sky was the colour of steel grey and dark. The sun climbing lower down the horizon every passing minute. I walked down the road quickly, rubbing my hands together every few minutes. There was almost no one else about except a policeman around the block who asked me for my slip and sent me on my way after confirmation. I reached the ration shop about 40 minutes later and stood in line for about 20 more before receiving my share and having my ration card stamped. It was a pitiful selection of only the most basic necessities. Carrots, onions, rice and lentils. Just enough to cover two daily square meals for every person in the household. Stretching it to a week would be difficult, but not impossible. Right as I was about to leave, I saw it. A small packet of something dark brown sitting unguarded on the officer's desk by the shop. Soldier's cocoa, rich, sweet, soft bars given to the military as sugar rations to keep them warm. The attending officer was directing the back of the line before the shop, and the package just sat there, untouched. As civilians, we hadn't had anything like this in months. Consumer production had stopped long ago, and there were no imports to speak of. I could almost taste the bar as I looked at it, every instinct telling me to reach out and grab a piece. Fifteen minutes later, I was walking down the road, a heavy bag of rations in each hand and a heavier bag stuffed in my back pocket. The skies had turned a darkening blue with patches of wispy red strewn about. It was going slow and my legs threatened to buckle every moment. My back was in absolute agony and I knew I needed to rest or risk falling face forward onto the hard tarmac. I took a few more steps and sat down with a huff, collapsing to the concrete sidewalk looking around me. The street lamps shone dimly in the dark, casting feeble incandescence on the streets. I was still a good half an hour from home, but this route was a shortcut and full of old, abandoned, industrial buildings, rising from the barren fields like great old rusted beasts. I sat up with a jolt as I remembered my father's words. Was I near a lane? Was I sitting before the mouth of one? I looked around frantically, heart pounding. But no, thankfully, the road was straight, with no lanes feeding into it until about a few dozen meters away. I heaved a sigh of relief. I got up and started walking, trudging slowly. Not five minutes later, I heard a shout. I looked back to see a policeman rushing down the street at me, his shadow long and jumpy against the yellow street lamp, he came to a stop right beside me. Officer, here's my permission slip. I... That's not it, boy. You took it, didn't you? I was genuinely taken aback. I'm... Sorry, sir. I don't know what you mean. He grunted and put his hand in his pocket. He pulled out a white piece of dark brown bars. You took these from the officer at the ration store, didn't you? That soldier's ration, son. Taking that is worse than theft. I almost laughed out loud. I had wanted to take the cocoa, yes, but at the very last moment I had restrained myself and walked away, not having so much as touched it. I promise you, sir, you can search me completely and you won't find a single piece on me. I know the law. I wouldn't take anything, I pleaded. The officer wasn't buying it, but he didn't seem like he wanted to mete out anything too harsh either. His green epilepsy suggested he was a rookie maybe six months into the military. He sighed and put his hands on his waist. All right, I'll have to go through your bags then. 
Come on. I complied, silent. I had nothing to hide. He led me forward until we reached the sizable section of the sidewalk, set me down, and went through my bags and backpack. As I expected, he found nothing. He stopped and looked up, dusting his hands together. He looked rather sorry about the whole thing. I guess you were right. The shopkeeper saw you eyeing the pack and figured you might have snapped it up. Probably just got swiped by someone else standing in line. I nodded. I'm sorry to cause you trouble, sir. He smiled and adjusted his rifle strap. Not a problem. You can go back... His words cut away mid-sentence and his eyes focus on something behind me. They narrowed, suspicious, and then widened, filling with what I could only believe was dread. There was something just a few feet from my back, and I couldn't see it. I turned my head slowly, straining my eyes to catch a glimpse of what it might be. My fingers suddenly felt cold, frozen more than the winter chill ever could, and I realized where we were. When the officer had asked me to come forward and set my supplies down, we had stopped before a lane. A narrow, moss-covered pathway fenced on both sides by high white walls of an old, industrial facility, threading away to my left to join a parallel road a few meters away. My father's words echoed in my head, rumbling like thunder, drenching me in yet unfounded fear. I jumped up and looked to where the officer was staring. There was something coming out of the corner, out of where the wall curved to enter the lane. At first glance, I thought it was a human hand. But, as it melted away from the wall, like something breaching the surface of a still sea, I saw it properly in the lamplight. First came the fingers, at least a dozen on each hand, dark and animated, as if made from shadows themselves. The arms followed, impossibly slender, jerking and cracking in the darkness. They were nightmarish. Behind me, the officer stared, open-mouthed, hands on his rifle, unsure. The head followed next. And, as it broke free from the wall, inky black, and turned away from us, I closed my eyes. It wasn't a conscious decision. It was my body reacting to the horrors of what I was seeing, a primeval response to keep my sanity from crumbling. We were both rooted to the spot, unable to move. I forced my eyes open a minute later and let them adjust to the darkness. The street lamps had all gone out and we were covered in a blanket of absolute, impenetrable darkness. It's standing right in front of you, son. I heard someone whisper. The officer had his handgun raised and a tobacco lighter with an open flame in his left hand. The harsh yellow glinted across the firearm and dissipated into the oppressive dark. I could only see a bare outline of what stood in front of me. It was tall, easily above seven feet. Its fingers twitched like centipedes writhing on the end of dark talons. Its limbs and torso were incredibly slender, only a few inches across the waist, and it shivered as if in unbridled anticipation. As my mind raced to find any rationality in this situation, to quell the terror coursing through my blood, I noticed something. The thing was standing, with its back to me. It was evident from how the meager light from the flame bounced off the curves of bone and sinew near its shoulder, and how the feet, two long, clawed talons, faced away from me. Its face, whatever it was, was turned away. Kid whispered the officer again. Move to your left. I'm going to shoot it. I had to force myself to understand what his words meant. Faced with something so alien, so unreal, my mind was falling to pieces. I tried to move over, but nothing happened. It was as if my feet and hands were weighed down and tied in place, like a ship moored at the harbour. I... Can't, I whispered back, tears streaming down my cheeks. I can't move. I can't move. 
Silence. Okay, wait there. I'll go around. I heard the scratch of his boot on the road as he shifted to his left to get a better shot. Almost immediately, the thing in front of me moved, mimicking the officer's steps until he was directly opposite to him and standing to my left. What the hell? The officer stepped back from me and the thing stepped back too, inching closer to my left until its writhing fingers was a hair's breadth from my face. The stench of it steamed around me and it smelled like burnt flesh and ash. Stop! I screamed. He's coming closer! The officer stopped in his tracks and retraced them, the thing moving parallel to his steps. If he moved right, it moved right. If he moved forward, it moved forward. The distance between him and the thing was constrained, unchanged, and all the while, it stayed facing away from us, its countenance hidden in deepening shadow. It's too close to you. I can't shoot. I'm going to circle around and push it against the wall so it can't move anymore. I squeezed my eyes shut and heard him move around me as the thing mimicked his position, staying away from him until he stopped. It came to a stop facing the wall beside me, a dozen or so feet behind where I stood. I heard a small exhale and a shot rang out, deafening in this tiny, claustrophobic alley. I looked back at it. The bullet glanced off the thing's back like chalk thrown at a blackboard. Four more shots rang out, each with no more effect than the one before. The bullets fell to the ground, crushed balls of lead glimmering faintly in the light of the dancing light of flame. I turned to look at the officer. His brow was covered with a sheen of sweat and his hands were shaking. He dropped the handgun and set the lighter down on the pavement. Its light threw long, dancing shadows against the pale white wall as he faced down the tall, dark creature. He took his rifle out and fired. A cacophony of shots rang out, the muzzle flash lighting up the whole lane in the flood of white and gold. It was like watching the frames of a hand-cranked film reel as the officer drew in closer and closer to the thing. The world was fire and darkness and gunfire and I could feel my ears ringing and my eyes burning while it built up to a crescendo. Then suddenly, it stopped. My eyes still swam with after images and I craned my neck backwards. My limbs were still frozen, the lighter still flickered, and in that little area illuminated by its wild flame, I saw the officer standing stock still with the thing inches away from him, its many fingered hands wrapped around his face. It had finally turned around. I stood as still as I could, straining to see from the corner of my eye. The thing was lifting up the man by his head, and as I followed him up, my eyes rested on his face. It was gaunt, inky black. There were no eyes, no nose, but at the very centre, there was a gaunt, gaping hole, a void lined with a single row of hundreds of small, sharp teeth. It covered nearly its entire visage, pulsating slowly, the teeth shifted and squirming in their lining. I screamed. The creature lifted the man up and put him headfirst into its mouth, all the way to his neck. Please, I yelled. Please, just stop. But my screams were empty. The shrieks of hapless prey resigned to the inescapable. I passed out before those teeth could come down on the flesh and bone, before the sounds of teeth gnashing against flesh would taunt my memory forever. When I woke up, I was at home. The military police had brought me back after finding me lying passed out in an alleyway. There was no mention of the officer. They simply ignored the notion of one of them having been there. Shots had been fired, yes, but on reaching the scene, they'd only found me and empty bags that used to contain a week's worth of rations. They had assumed I'd been attacked by a dissident for the food and narrowly escaped, and I said nothing to disabuse them of that idea. When my father came home at the end of the lockdown, 
He hugged me and cried until he couldn't any more. He had never seen it before, but he knew what it was, that thing. There was no need to be scared of it now. There were people out and about, and it followed its own rules to the letter. They call it the priest. My grandfather told me about it when I was younger than you are. He wiped away the tears from his eyes and fumbled with a shoddily wrapped package that he took out from his travel bag and handed it to me. He then walked over to the other room and brought over a large binder, its cardboard cover crumbling and rat-eaten, its yellow pages almost indecipherable. I had never read it before, but I knew it was my grandfather's journal. He started going through it, running his fingers across the lines, reading. It lived on this land before humans. Maybe it was here before the animals too. So old that the oldest families in town have accounts of it leading all the way up to the first settlements, when men from another land came here across the oceans to claim ours. When they came ashore, they found the oldest generations of our people praying to something. The outsiders thought it was superstition, until one of their parties found a temple in the mountains, a building so big that the rustic natives could never have built it at the conjunction of seven roads. What was it? I had whispered, taking the packet from my father. They didn't know, but it was taller than the tallest ships, stacked on each other twenty times. It dwarfed every grand palace and tower of the west by many magnitudes. Every fortnight, the natives would send over a man with lentils and rice as an offering, so the priest that lived in the temple could gather it for his god. The man would leave the offering at the meeting point of two roads and stand away from it. He had to be alone and was on no account to ever approach the offerings or the priest when it came to take the food away, for that would be folly. I had finally unwrapped the package and two dark, fragrant bars fell out Soldier's Cocoa. The irony was so explicit that I nearly laughed out loud. They tasted warm and rich, and when I fell asleep that night, I dreamt of seven crooked shadows surrounding a giant granite building covered in moss and decay and sporting a single sandstone door. As the years passed, my memory of the incident remained unchanged, as if it were a canvas painted in the dredges of my memory, lacquered with blood. No one but my father and I knew about it, and we vowed to keep it that way. As for why I'm telling this now, it's no mean task to guess. The world is under quarantine, the streets are empty, and if you live on my land, then you must know the perils of it. You must know never to pay tribute to the priest. Man has been on this earth millions of years, exploring the planet, building civilizations, killing and creating an endless cycle. Man first went into space starting almost 80 years ago. Think about it, we spent all this time getting around our own planet, arguing over the smallest bits of land, but when we finally set our mind to space travel, it only took us a few decades to get where we wanted to go. I am proud to say, my grandmother was one of those that helped us to get there. She started out back in 1959, fresh out of college, as an intern for NASA. The space race was really going strong, the US versus the Soviets, and she managed to get in right in the middle. Graham stayed there for 40 more years, only retiring before Y2K. She's up there in years now and I wanted to try do something to preserve the memories she had of that time, so I began to collect her stories. We started out with the basics, talking about how she joined, what she did, the history surrounding everything when she was there, all the things you learn in high school history class. When we started discussing the mission she worked on though, that's when I realised that there was a lot of history missing. Locked up, never to be heard or read by anyone, nor should it. There's a reason space exploration has slowed down. 
There were missions made off the books and off record, launched from secret black sites around the world. Graham both saw and heard terrors beyond her comprehension from the dark void of space. She shared these stories with me. These secrets kept from us by those in power. The human price of our curiosity is much higher than we're led to believe, and these people deserve to have their stories known. I'm enclosing one of her stories here. She can get a bit long-winded, as some do in their old age, so I've tried to edit down anything that isn't relevant. I'm still going through everything with her as well. With her age, she can't stay focused for very long, so we're doing these little interviews in our sessions every day. I'll transcribe and upload what I can when I can. What follows is the transcript of what Graham told me on April 4th, 2020. Any interjections of my own will be formatted with brackets around them. My name is Evelyn Lara Smart. I was a mission control contact with NASA from 1959 to 1999. I was the one that any astronaut or crew would speak to, the voice on the ground. I relay this information back to whoever needed it in flight control, navigation, engineering and such. I didn't set out to work there. It just sort of fell into my lap. I had worked as a switchboard operator, mostly taking emergency calls for the local departments. NASA was doing some recruiting, and one of my supervisors recommended me. Then, before I knew it, there I was, sitting in the big mission control room, watching the big screen with the video feed, and talking to our very own spacemen. Here, she goes into a tangent about how lovely Armstrong and Aldrin are, with many mentions about Christmas cards from the latter. So, one of the first missions I was there for was the first picture of Earth from orbit. Obviously, being in communication, I wasn't really necessary, but we were all crowded into the control room to see the picture as soon as it was transmitted. Granted, it was the late 50s, so we were waiting for quite a while. We expected cheers when it came through finally. It started that way, at least. Then, everything quickly died down. There was the Earth, the huge curve with a beautiful crown of light from the sun shining around it. We captured something else too, though. Something that I fear I'll see again one day. Behind the Earth, off in the distance, was something... giant. It wasn't completely clear, but what you could make out was a clearly defined torso, arms outstretched with wicked spines jutting from the outside. Large red eyes blazed against the dark void behind the figure, with a gaping maw underneath opened in a terrifying roar. The scale of this thing was huge. No way it could be seen from a normal telescope here on Earth. We aimed our most powerful telescope at the coordinates we estimated it to be at and swept the sky, but couldn't see it anywhere took another picture from the satellite and it was gone, as if it had never been there. To this day, we don't know what the hell it was. We check for it in every photo we take, every sweep of the sky, and it's only shown up two more times since then, once in 1979 and once in 1999. I don't know how many people in the agency know, so God knows if it's been there again. Every time it showed up, though, it appeared larger. Here, she goes on about a few notable advances in tech, most irrelevant to what we're discussing now. What a lot of people don't realize is that there were manned space flights before the ones on the history books. Sure, there's always been the theories about lost cosmonauts and such from the Soviets, and there are definitely true cases of that. But we had our share as well. There was the initial manned spaceflight in 1960, the Daedalus. She noticed the look of shock on my face, apparently, and laughed. Never read about that one, eh? It was kept tightly under wraps. We didn't want anyone to know about it until we had them back on the ground successfully. Otherwise, it may kill morale around the office. No, we kept a small crew, launched the rocket off from an isolated area of Alaska, we did a lot of launches from there. Kept the Reds on their toes back in the day. Anyway, 
there was a three-man crew. There was Bill Zask, James Hanlon, and Terry Duncan. Those three were a tight crew. They were supposed to go up, orbit for 12 hours, then come back down. We would pass it off as a comet if anyone saw. But, never got that chance. Things went south fast. They took off. All was fine until they hit the upper atmosphere. They tried to ease back on the jets, make sure they made it into orbit and didn't overshoot. Everything went to hell. Jets wouldn't cut off. We don't know what caused the malfunction. I heard them, shouting, trying to fix the issue. It didn't happen. They flew straight through, getting just enough adjustment from the orbital pull to be shot off course and towards the direction of the sun. She lets out a sigh here, shaking her head. Jets continued firing, taking them even further out. We maintained radio contact with them for 20 hours after takeoff. I spoke with them as fuel ran out. They began drifting into the void, no hope of turning, never to feel solid ground again. To this day, I don't know if it was something they really saw or the insanity getting to them as they died and faced their mortality. James was the first to begin raving, telling us about the bodies floating by the cockpit windows. I tried to clarify what he meant, assuming celestial bodies. I'll never forget the response from Bill. No, Evelyn, he said to me. Human bodies, dozens of them. They described the field of bodies, male and female, old and young, all naked as the day they were born. Bill swore that one smiled at him as he went by. We didn't have live feed cameras at the time, unfortunately, so we weren't able to confirm. The way he described them though, I have no doubt they were seeing all of this. A lot of the transmissions got lost in static, limits of the tech at the time. The last broadcast we received was Bill. He was raving, still talking about the bodies. He said they were talking to him now, telling him he could live forever with them. He said he was going to open the emergency hatch. Maybe it was my emotions getting the better of me. Right before he opened it and the static took over. I swear, there was another voice. She drifts off and stares out the window next to her. The sun went down an hour ago. Stars were plainly visible, shining in the inky darkness. I asked what the voice said. It's ingrained in my head. I can hear it clear as the moment sixty years ago. Come, be with us, become the stars and drift immortal. Graham is tired, say she's going to bed. End transcription. Graham is in one hell of a mood today. Not sure if she's just feeling better than usual, or something has got her riled up. Either way, she's letting her feelings be known. That's just a forewarning before we get into this transcription. There are things about her here that I personally never wanted to hear. No, really. She can tell me about how she saw eldritch beings in the vastness of space and none of that is as terrifying as her talking about hooking up with astronauts in the training areas. Ugh. Here's the transcription. I'm going to chug bleach. Conversation from April 5th, 2020. Again, this is being told by Graham and translated by me. My own interjections are in these brackets. Ah, so you want to hear more. All right, guess it's time to turn this BS off. Live through the damn missile crisis and I'm going to get taken out because nobody's competent enough to stay in their damn houses. Graham has been cursing like a sailor all day. She only does this when she's either very happy or very anxious. So, let's see. I told you we had some crews up there already, yeah? Just couldn't get any successful returns down. Damn Reds beat us to that. Joke was on them, though. They just tossed Gaggering up there in a metal tube and waited for him to come back down on his own. We actually had our own man pilot themselves back down to Earth. How's that for you? Russians don't have crap on American determination. 
So we did a few other missions once we finally got the hang of putting people up there and bringing them back down. It was all smooth sailing for the most part. So now, what did we decide to do? Put a man on the goddamn moon. She gets up and goes to the kitchen, returning with a bottle of red wine and a comically large glass. I mentioned to her that it's only around two in the afternoon. I worked with astronauts, darling. Days don't matter when you're orbiting the Earth. Anyway, it was 1962 that we crashed a vessel on the far side of the moon. That was something of a test run, I suppose. Seeing just how bad we could crash and burn before we tried it again with people inside. We had the Ranger 4 vessel that we sent up there. Had to do a flyby of the moon for a bit and take some photos before dive bombing it to the surface and taking some pictures for us there. We never released those to the public. Scared the hell out of all of us in the command center when they transmitted back. Keep in mind, all the pictures we had at the time were black and white still. No color photography on that scale yet. So, Ranger 4 lands there and immediately begins snapping pictures. All of us are standing around, expecting to see just a barren expanse of grey rock. Nothing all too special. Lo and behold, the first picture comes back, and there's someone just... standing there. Right in front of the crash capsule. We couldn't tell the gender or race or anything. They were in a spacesuit that looked remarkably like the ones we were developing. So naturally we think, oh no... They beat us to the moon, because who else could it be at this point? The Russians were the only other country keeping any kind of pace with us. Then we realized it couldn't be them. They would have already been rubbing it in our faces if they had landed a man on the moon. There's no way this was from anyone on our planet. That's when the rest of the pictures started coming in. The suit kept getting closer and closer to the capsule maintaining the same stance the whole time. It just kind of floated over to it. Then, you could see into the visor of the helmet, where there should have been someone's face visible. There was just... fire. Pure, bright flame. Then, the picture stopped. Nothing else came from Ranger 4. She finishes off a glass of wine, or half-gallon, it's hard to tell from the size of the glass. She immediately empties the rest of the bottle into it. I'll give the higher-ups and NASA credit, though. Crazy buggers didn't let seeing a flaming cosmonaut stop them from going ahead with their plans. We plugged away at it, sending up more and more missions to orbit the Earth, do flybys of the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, anything we could get near. We saw a few oddities here and there as we went, but things stayed mostly silent for those years. Maybe we just didn't notice it, because we were so focused on the mission at hand. Then, it finally happened in 1969, as you well know. We got to the moon. Beat the Russians there, after all. There was that big televised bit with Neil and Buzz taking the steps onto the surface and everything. I really hated those suits they had him in. Didn't get to accentuate Buzz's best features for sure. The man had the best ass in the entire galaxy. This was one of five tangents about Buzz Aldrin's physical features throughout the day. I've edited these out for the sake of mine and your sanity. You ever consider that we landed someone on the moon and sent up missions to land again and again for the next three years, then just quit cold turkey and never went back? Why do you think that is, hmm? Hey, I thought you wanted to hear about all this. At this point, she threw the remote for the television at me. I had retreated to my mental safe space during the Buzz Aldrin diatribe. Well, we did go back. A few times. This wasn't for the scientific research we did the last three years. No, this was for anthropological purposes. We found things on the moon. We weren't the first beings there. No, we started finding small signs with the Apollo 14 mission. There were some little remnants of previous visitors. The first thing they found was some symbols carved into crater walls. Nothing that we could translate, of course. Nobody knew what the hell they meant, but we knew they weren't naturally occurring. That much was obvious. They took all the pictures of the ones they found. 
pretty sure they're still working on it to this day. They all probably cracked the Zodiac Cypher before that damn thing. Apollo 17 was when they knew they needed to carry this one on privately. That's the, quote, last manned moon mission that happened in 1972. For all the world knows, we ain't been back since. That's the way they want to keep it. Apollo 17 found way more than anyone previously had. They found full-on structures. Altars of worship is what it looked like. I can't even describe the images transmitted back. The way these things were built. It wasn't natural. There's no way that structures built that way should be allowed to stand. It was like the ghost of Lovecraft possessed Esther and made him design some screwed up church. We advised them not to go inside. We would send another mission up there with some better training and equipment to document all of this. That's where Apollo 18 to 22 came in. Before they left though, they photographed the structure from every angle. We didn't notice it until the day that it appeared absolutely identical no matter what angle it was viewed from. 100% symmetry. Everything aligned perfectly no matter how insane it was built up. Graham finishes the second glass of wine, leaning back in a chair. Well, I believe that's enough wine for one hour. Time for a good nap. All of that talk of buzz got me thinking about the old days. I turned off the recorder and ran from the room. I can still hear Graham cackling from downstairs. April 6th, 2020. I'm going stir crazy. Graham seems to get stronger every day somehow. It's like she's stealing my youth and thriving in isolation. This may end up being a record of me going insane with her stories mixed in. Let's go sit out on the porch. It's a nice day out. I'm tired of being cooped up in here. I concede that I could use some fresh air, but make a promise not to go near the neighbours or anybody walking by in the street. She gives me an entirely too sarcastic scout salute and swears she won't. Alright, that's better. Feel my battery recharging already. Now, ah, the moon church was what I was telling you about yesterday, right? That was some crazy stuff. So, Apollo 17 found this crazy structure that was just perfectly built. Strangest architecture I'd ever seen. It made no goddamn sense to anyone how it remained standing after all this time. So, we trained some other crews to go up after and look into it further. Specifically, that had degrees in anthropology and ancient cultures. Maybe we could find some links here between this and things that have been found on Earth. Well, naturally, nothing is ever that easy. They head up there in 1973, land smack next to the structure found by the previous mission, and get to it. By this point, technology has thankfully improved, so we have cameras in their helmets that allow us to see everything they see. I asked her how they had this kind of tech in 73, when a lot of things were still incredibly basic with video, especially transmitted over that vast of a distance. You really think the stuff you saw from that time was the most advanced technology being used by the government? Don't underestimate the amount of money the American government will throw at something if they feel it's a threat. The cameras and equipment we had on those missions was on par with that little video camera your mama gave me for Christmas a few years back. She's talking about the GoPro she got her four years ago. The records in 4K. What the hell? Now she's laughing at me again. Like I said, don't underestimate government spending. So, anyway, Apollo 18 was a three-man crew. Jason Voss, Ben Codd, and Arthur Wayne. Wasn't too happy about Arthur going up there. We had spent a few months together while he was training down at Cape Canaveral. God, if he could do half the things he could do in our gravity up there. If only I could edit my memory the same way I do this transcript. So, they got to work. Jason stayed in orbit around the moon, making sure everything on the main ship was fine. Arthur and Ben went down to the surface and set up base camp. There was the structure, and not even 100 feet away was their little landing pod, set up with everything in it. They were equipped for three days on the moon. First day goes off fine, just walking around the thing, taking measurements and samples. 
they determine that most of the structure is made from an unknown element. To this day, I don't think they've found out what it is. So, end of day one, and they go back to their base camp. Now, we have a couple of cameras set up in the pod, so we can see everything going on, just in case there's any issues technically, or well, God forbid, something happens between them. Arthur and Ben are both fast asleep. We've got the feed playing in command, just to monitor and keep an eye on everything. And suddenly, it glitches. Not a drawn out one though. Just a quick scramble, then it's back. Arthur and Ben are still asleep. Now, there's a figure, standing there in the airlock though. Like nothing I've ever seen. Long limbs, big hands that almost look like bulldozers, and just a rounded off knob right at the shoulders. I hit the intercom speaker for the capsule as fast as I could move, screaming at them to wake up. Poor Ben fell straight out of his bunk and onto Arthur underneath him, belly to belly. Now that's something I normally would have paid to see, but right now, my heart was racing for the wrong reasons. So, they both scramble up and look towards the airlock. That damn thing is still just standing there. I think it was looking at them. Arthur shouts at it, asking what the hell it wants. There's this low garble of noise that happens. Nothing discernible. It could have been interference for all we know. But by God, I saw Ben's face drain of all colour when it happened. Arthur went a bit slack, looking from Ben to the creature. Then, as fast as it showed up, it was gone. Poof, right into... Well, guess you can't say thin air being where it was. Ben sat down on Arthur's bunk and just cried. It took him a good hour to actually calm down. In the meantime, we had no idea what was happening. Finally, he chilled out enough for us to ask him what had happened. He said that the thing had looked at him. No eyes or anything, but he knew it was looking at him. It said, she was never meant to live. Now, this shook all of us. Almost a month before the mission, Ben and his wife suffered a miscarriage. She had been six months along. They were expecting a little girl. Then one day, the baby was just gone. No heartbeat, no activity. They didn't know what had happened. It tore Ben and his wife apart. They had a huge fight a week before liftoff because she didn't want him to go. Didn't want to lose another person she loved. I can't imagine what he felt when he heard that damn thing talk. They cut the mission short after that. Everyone was afraid of what may happen to Ben's mental state if anything else happened. They packed up quick and got the hell out of there. Ben dragged himself stupid afterwards, ended up driving his car off the interstate going 150 at around 3 in the morning. They barely got anything to bury. Graham wipes a stray tear from her eye. A man is jogging down the street with his dog, coming closer to our house. Graham calls out a greeting to him. He walks up and begins talking, much to my displeasure. Graham is speaking animatedly and leans down to pet the dog. I remind her we're supposed to be distancing just to be safe. Sorry, Jerry. My grandson here is a hard ass. I'll see you some other time. Anyway, that was the end of Apollo 18. Not a whole lot found out, but we were ready to try again. I was just grateful that Arthur had made it back in one piece. We were actually engaged, you know. Way back in the day, before he went up on that 19 mission in 74. I was a bit surprised at this. As far as I was told, Graham had never been married, and my grandfather had been killed in a car accident not long after she found out she was pregnant with my mother. We spent a lot of time together during that time. It was lovely. I miss that man. So, Arthur and Jason volunteered to go back on the 19 mission. I think Arthur was determined to get into that structure and see exactly what was going on with it. They had a new recruit along with them as well. Paul Orson. He was a former Green Beret during the Vietnam War. Tough son of a gun and not one for conversation. They didn't know what they would find though, so they wanted someone with combat training to go up. 
Everything goes as normal. It's old hat at this point. They land in the same spot for base camp. Arthur and Paul this time. They got there on day one and set everything up. Then decided to rest up for a few hours and go straight in. Well, they didn't realize that they needed to find a way in first. Apparently, in all this time researching the structure, everyone just assumed there would be a door somewhere. No such luck. Everything on the wall outside was smooth. No cracks or seams signaling a door. They searched every damn inch of that thing. Nothing to be found. Lo and behold, I'm watching in on Arthur's camera while he's walking around the structure. Even in low gravity, he had two left feet. He tripped and fell straight through the wall. We thought we had lost him for a minute. It looked like the camera had hit something and shorted out. Then he asked us if we were seeing it too. The interior of the structure was larger than the exterior. Way more room to move about. Lights hung in the air like stars, bathing everything around him in a soft glow. It was like its own miniature galaxy contained in that one building. Probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Arthur backed out then, wanting to make sure he could travel freely in and out of the structure before he got trapped in there and it seemed to work fine. It was like there was a portal, a thin veil where it looked like a wall but wasn't. He grabbed Paul and showed him what he had found. Don't think he was too impressed. More like he was ready to shoot it if he could have found a gun. Exploring it further, they found a small spiral slope, almost like a ramp that went downward from the main chamber. They followed it for probably an hour before it got anywhere, seeing more of those strange symbols all over the walls on the way down. When they got to the bottom, it was like some kind of church. No idea what they worshipped or who, but there was an altar right there against the far wall. A statue rose up in the recess behind it. Looked to me like an elongated pyramid of sorts. Not really sure how to describe the geometry of it. There were angles that merged with smaller angles. Curves where lines were. It was like my brain was trying to comprehend it through the camera feed, but just jumbled everything instead. That was about the time we noticed the spots on the altar. We're not 100% sure to this day what it was, but we had a good enough guess. It was dried, had obviously been there for quite a long time, but it still had that rusty red colour that only comes from dried blood. It was splashed all over the place up there, like someone had slid the jugular and waved all about up there. Had to have been gallon spilled out. That was enough for the two men for that day. They headed back up to base camp to make record of what they found and go back to sleep. They were out maybe two or three hours when it happened again. The camera glitched just like the last time and that thing appeared. It wasn't in the airlock this time though. It appeared right next to their damn bunks. We tried warning them, but it didn't seem to work. It's like our speakers were jammed. We were only able to watch in terror as that thing leaned over Paul and said something to him in that garbled noise we heard last time. God knows what it was. Then it was gone again. Nothing there. Paul got up and started putting on his suit to go outside then. I kept hitting the button, trying to ask what the hell he was doing. Got no response. Our line into the main capsule was dead. When he had the whole suit on, I tried the line going directly to his helmet. I said, Paul, what the hell did that thing say to you? You know what he told me? I shook my head in response. He looked straight up into the capsule camera before stepping out and said, Finishing what they began. I still get chills thinking about that. It was one of the coldest things I've ever heard. By that time, Arthur had woken up and was getting his suit on as fast as he could. God, I begged him not to go after Paul, not to go into that damn church. Whatever was done in there before was bad, and there wasn't going to be anything good coming out of it. He was too good of a man though. He got everything on and chased Paul in there. 
No idea how he had moved so fast, but Paul was waiting down there for him already, standing right on the altar and holding an old combat knife. Arthur shouted at him, asking what the hell he thought he was doing. He didn't say a damned word, just started lunging towards Arthur, brandishing that knife. I watched it all. All of it. Each of the helmet cameras was on at different sides of the big command screen. A coordinator was shouting at me to tell them to stop and get themselves together. It wouldn't have done anything. There wasn't Paul in that suit anymore. There was a blind rage in his eyes. His breathing on the mic was like an animal that had been cornered. No, he wanted to kill, and he didn't care who he saw. They went back and forth for a while, throwing each other all around that unholy place. Finally, Arthur managed to wrestle a knife away from Paul. He stood up, holding it out in front of him. There were tears in his voice when he was talking, telling Paul to stay away, telling him they could go back home and have a drink, act like all of this never happened. It didn't matter. Paul rushed, and Arthur had no choice. He dug down and thrust the knife upward. The camera in Paul's suit was splattered with red as he depressurized in seconds. Arthur screamed, looking at that altar and throwing the knife at it. He just lay there for a while, sobbing and shouting curses. He was alone up there. Graham's voice cracked. I've tried to transcribe the next part as best as I can, but some parts were difficult to make out. Arthur started pulling Paul's body back up towards the exit with him. Even if he had tried to kill him, he wasn't just going to leave him up there, all alone on a rock. He got to the top and tried to go through the wall back outside. But it was suddenly solid. No give. He tried the other walls, trying to make sure that he wasn't using the wrong one in his emotional state. Nothing. Still, no way out. He collapsed against the wall, taking in deep, shy breaths. His oxygen tank only had about 10 minutes left by his count. The suits weren't designed for long outings back then. I hit the button to talk to him and tried to soothe him. He was almost hysterical, but I like to think hearing me helped him go quietly. I still remember seeing his face on that helmet camera. My last words to him, the little smile that he got right before he passed. He got to know that even though he was dying up there, on a mission, completely off the books, there would be part of him still living right here on Earth. Graham wiped tears away from her eyes. She had been openly sobbing, obviously reliving something painful. I put my hand out for her to take. The last three missions they sent up there served two purposes. They were recovery missions to get those bodies back home and give them a proper burial. And demolition missions. They could not get back through the wall into the chamber the normal way, so they tried drilling through. There was no chamber though, just solid rock no matter how far they drilled into it. So they gave up after that. The next two missions brought explosives and detonated them around the structure, destroying it. We haven't gone back to the moon since then. Not even after that loss. Even if we had, I wouldn't have worked the mission. I would have absolutely refused. I told them I wasn't taking on any more crude landing missions after that. They would have to find another communications head. She stared at me for a moment, before looking back out toward the sky. The moon was already hanging there, right at the cusp of night. She let out a long sigh. Some nights, I look out at the moon and like to think he's still out there, watching over me, watching over us. He would be proud that I'm finally telling someone about this. He'd always talked about having a family and grandchildren one day. I think he's up there right now, giving that sly grin he always had. I'm sure he's proud of you, wherever he is. Graham looked for a moment more as I sat there, stunned. Then she got up, gave me a hug, and went back inside to get ready for bed. 
evening of April 9th, 2020. Graham asked me to sit on the porch and watch the moon tonight. Says this is the last of her stories. Can't believe I've been retired for 20 years now. Seems crazy at this point. Leaving the job, helping raise you kids. It was worth it though. You turned out okay. She gives a little chuckle here. So, there's two more things that happened right before I quit. One is a direct result of the other. Care to hear? I nodded. So, in 97, we put the very first rover up on Mars. We started it looking to see if it could support life up there, you know. Trying to expand out beyond our own planet. Hell, it's already crowded here. Has been since man first walked. Best thing about all this social distancing is I have an excuse to tell people to bugger off. Pathfinder was something though. Ugly little contraption. You wouldn't think it could get 10 feet, much less across a barren planet full of dust and rocks. But damn, that little thing moved. It was zipping here and there across the land, taking pictures and videos, scooping up samples and analysing them right then and there. Wonder of science. So, we're looking at all these pictures being sent back, amazed at everything we're seeing. There's huge sand dunes, cliffs. This place is like a giant desert, but it's beautiful. That was when the first storm moved in. Storms up there aren't like ours. There's no rain. Just wind and lightning. The wind stirs up the sand and makes it hard to see. Blocks out most of the light. So Pathfinder is up there. Sand and dust swirling around. Then, in a flash of lightning, you see this towering figure. It was thin, incredibly tall. Everything about it was disproportionate though. It wasn't until the next flash of lightning that we connected it. It was one of those damn things from the moon. The ones that appeared when Skylab returned. This one was so much bigger though. At least ten times the size of the first one we saw. When this one spoke, we all heard it. It wasn't just some garbled mess of noise this time. It was plain as day. After it happened, we all realised that we hadn't heard it out loud though. But in our minds, each one hearing the same thing. The temple will live on. We ruled and shall rule again, worshipping amongst the stars. Then, it was gone in the storm. Never saw one as large as that again. Haven't seen any of them since then actually. Pathfinder didn't have any other encounters up there the entire time. And as far as I've heard from the folks that are still working, they haven't found anything else out of the ordinary. NASA made it a point to contact the other countries to tell them about the temple at that point. Naturally, the Russians already knew about it. The buggers. Turned out they had gone up to the moon at some point and found the ruins of the temple up there took some of it back with them, and ended up having it lose all kinds of control back in 86. A lot of lives got lost up there because they didn't know what they were messing around with. They were experimenting with it in some underground lab when it went out of control. But of course, what's their first reaction when a damn space temple and those damn things show up in the backyard? They nuke the thing straight to hell, killing a ton of their own citizens and covering it up as some reactor meltdown. The footage they showed us. I'll never forget it. These buggers didn't even nuke it right away. That's why there was so much fallout. They let it go on for at least a week, absorbing everything and recording what happened. There were people inside that altar room when their worship session broke out. Those poor souls deserved so much more mercy than anyone could give them. After that, we all agreed that our first priority was protecting the earth from whatever this was not allowing any of that back down here. That was the time they started on the space station. Now, I don't know much of what they've been up to recently with it, since it was just being launched when I retired. They built it to keep a better eye on things out there in orbit, where they could conduct experiments and run some countermeasures right there, without anyone on Earth being any wiser. Smart move, I think. I know now, long before I left, they had a satellite that found the chain of bodies again, the same one that took the first man crew up there. We could hear the whispers being transmitted back. I still wake up some nights hearing those whispers. What did they say? 
come to us, be sacrifices, float eternal as a living altar to them. Them? Beats the hell out of me. Maybe it was that big thing they saw in the photos. Maybe that's what the temple was built to worship. Or whatever we were warned about by the follower. There's so many things we still don't know about what's out there. Probably things we will never know. It's all just lost in the vastness of space, never meant to be understood. We're still here though. That's something. So, they've been keeping us safe until now. Maybe it's something else though. Watching over us. The moon was out in full on the horizon now, shining bright as it rose further. Graham got up and walked out into the moonlight, looking upward. I know you're out there, Arthur. I know you're watching over all of us. You stayed up there because you were a stubborn old bugger, thinking you had to do everything to keep people from seeing what you saw. I felt you the other night, though. That full moon, you were there. We're going to dance in the moonlight together again, real soon. I love you. Graham tells me she's going to stay out here for a while. I'm going to go up and start transcribing all of this. Maybe get some actual relaxation in. I'm tired of being stuck in this damn house. Graham was dancing around in the moonlight as I walked back inside, humming Fly Me to the Moon to herself as she did. April 10th, 2020. Graham passed away early this morning. I had walked into the kitchen for a drink and noticed that the front door was still cracked open. This wasn't normal for two in the morning, so I walked out to check. Graham was sitting in a rocking chair on the porch, drenched in the bright moonlight. She had a smile on her face. She died peacefully in her sleep carried off into the moonlight by the one she loved. There was a heavy onset of storms in our area recently. I won't tell you exactly where, but I will tell you that the land here is mostly flat and therefore not conductive to dealing with rain in biblical proportions. About once a year, it usually floods so bad that the locals joke about the coming of God and his angels. My grandma, bless her, lives along a road that is notoriously bad for these sorts of problems. Once, on one such incident, when I was visiting, I saw a man misjudge just how deep the water was and plow his truck straight into a makeshift four-foot river. He desperately had to escape his vehicle as it drifted down the street and make the embarrassing weight of shame over to one of the neighbor's inclined driveways. It doesn't help that my grandma's neighborhood is quite old as well. She raised my dad and his sister in the house she lives in now, though their bedrooms have long since been remodeled into a guest bedroom and an office respectively. My dad's tried to coax her out several times as the houses began to have numerous and serious problems due to age. Rusted pipes, electrical issues, the amount of clutter that comes with living in a house for 50 plus years. You know, that sort of thing. So, it came as no surprise that during the most recent round of floods, I received a frantic call from my grandma saying that the sump pump in her basement broke. I am the only family who lives closer to her now, so... I'm usually the go-to when stuff like this happens, even more than those qualified to do so. My dad, who's good at handiwork, recently moved out of the States for his job, and his sister passed quite a few years back, leaving no one behind but us. Plus, Grandma is a bit too old to haggle with professional handyman herself, so I'm used to rolling up my sleeves and heading over at the drop of a dime nowadays. It's never a hassle though. I love my grandma dearly, and I make time for her whenever I can, whether that's taking her to appointments or helping around the house with chores. She takes priority over anything else in my life. When I got there, Grandma was a wreck, wailing over the potential loss of precious photos, old newspapers, and whatever else she's kept stored down there for how many years. I took the time to comfort her, sit her down on the couch, 
and put the chilling cup of tea she had been nursing before she heard the rushing water back into her hands. I've got it, I told her, or something along those lines. The basement honestly wasn't as bad as I expected. It was only the unfurnished laundry slash storage room in the back that got the water in it so far, and even then, it was a thin layer that would only get the pads of your feet wet. I do remember noticing something odd though, even then. One of the basement windows, which should have been doused in the milky grey of the storm, instead parted a thin line of yellow light into the room. It stretched like a spotlight over one of the stacks of books on the floor, their faded colours absorbing all of the light they could. This would only strike me as ominous later though. For now, the sump pump, which had cracked due to the sheer volume of water it was trying to filter out, was slushing out water in thick bursts. One quick Google search and a following call brought a plumber to our door in 15 minutes. The problem was fixed easily, thank God, and we sent the man back on his way with a bag of fresh baked cookies that my grandma had made that morning. That's not a super important detail, but I just wanted you to know the type of person my grandma is. So, easy part was over. Then was just the business of cleaning up the aftermath. I assured my grandma that I had clean up handled, especially since she already had a shop vac I could use to suck up the water with. After promising several times just to sop up all the water and not throw anything out, I descended those old, creaky stairs once more and got to work. The storm continued to rage outside, the newly fixed sump pump slugged and churned the runoff into the drainage hole, and I vacuumed. I'm sure it was quite the ruckus. All those noises combined into some strange song. My grandma never came down once to complain though, and I like my music loud, so it wasn't really a problem. I finished vacuuming pretty fast, and it was only when I was clicking the vacuum off that I noticed the stack of books again. It was no longer bathed in that impossibly honeysuckle light, but it was still eye-grabbing enough for some reason. I made my way over to it and quickly realised that most of the books in the stack were ruined beyond repair. Poking them, I found them all sopping wet, except for the one at the very top. This was extremely peculiar, as the stack came to about my knees and the water, even at its highest, had only hit my ankles. I picked up the top, unsullied book. It was beautiful. Pocket-sized and leather-bound with fancy stitching. The edges of all the pages had been dyed a pure and endless black. On the front, a delicate pair of lips had been carefully carved into the cover. The false mouth parted like it was about to tell a secret. It felt almost brand new. Opening it up to the first page immediately revealed who it belonged to. Juliet Desd Belsong, my long-since-deceased aunt. My grandmother called for me from the top of the stairs, startling me enough that I almost dropped the book. She asked if I was finished. I replied that I was, and she told me that was excellent because she wanted help with the next batch of pastries. Now, I'm not exactly proud to admit this, but I knew with a great deal of certainty that my grandmother could not find out about this diary. My grandmother is a wonderful person. She is everything you could think of and more when you think of nice little old grandmas. In my very heart and soul, I know she could compete with Nobel Peace Prize winners for the amount of humility and compassion she has for the world around her. She is not above her humanity, however. None of us can absolve ourselves of being broken by the human condition, no matter how much we may want to. It is only the shape of the pedestal you build with the remaining pieces that define you as a person. And while my grandmother's pedestal is as radiant as she is, nothing can quite knock her off it like the mention of a murdered daughter. So, I put the diary in the back pocket of my jeans and went up to help my grandmother. I honestly forgot about it until I got home later that evening and was getting undressed to go to bed. The diary fell out of my pants pocket and landed on the hardwood of my bedroom floor with a barely audible thud, the soft leather absorbing most of the impact. 
As I bent down to pick it up, the book cracked open in a flurry of motion, pages flying as if struck by a harsh wind. A cloud of dust exploded outward, sending me startling back upright and into a coughing fit. Waving my hand in front of my face a moment later to clear the last remaining particles out of it, I stared down at the book through blurred vision. It sat open, flipped nearly to the end, and appeared uninterested in continuing its outburst. The pages exposed were empty, except for a single sentence written across the top line of the right page in shaky scrawl. He places a kiss upon my lips, even as my words continue to crawl through. The words were coated in a rosy, romantic hue, as the only light in my room comes from a lamp covered in a pink satin lampshade, a housewarming gift from Grandma. I picked it up gently after that, far more gently than any other book I might have accidentally dropped. A feeling of apprehension was settling into me now, and I thought of the thin trail of light that led my attention to the book in the first place. What then looked holy, now seemed more like a falsehood. I should have thrown out the book. I know that now. It had belonged to my aunt though, and no matter how spooky it now seemed, there was a certain sentimentality behind it. The romantic idea of getting closer to a relative only remembered in misty memories of Christmas dinners and backdoor barbecues. I'd be lying if there wasn't an appealing air of mystery to the whole thing too. No one in my family had ever talked to me about how my aunt had died. At the time, I was too young to hear the gory details, and when I was finally old enough, no one wanted to relive the memories. I flipped through the rest of the pages until I hit the back of the book. All empty. Whoever had kissed Juliet as she continued to speak, they were the last person she ever wrote about, at least in this journal. I glanced around my room at this point, but nothing was out of place. I walked over to the window and found it was tightly closed, so whatever phantom breeze had blown in hadn't come from it. None of the other subjects in my room appeared to have been toppled over either. Even the notes and books on the desk in the corner of my room were fine. I placed the book under my nightstand and finished changing before crawling into bed. I didn't turn off the lamp like I normally would though. Instead, picking up the book again from beside it and flipping again to that last page. Running my fingers across the grooves of ink, I considered my options. At this point, I had been unnerved enough to consider returning the book to Grandma the next day, or maybe even calling my father that night. Something prevented me from doing that, and I convinced myself it was the curiosity of it all. Besides, I thought, the book had to have some rational explanation for why it opened the way it did. I just didn't understand it yet. It's surprising how quickly the human brain can write off the things it doesn't want to believe in. We clutch onto our deadly truths until they take us down with them. I turned the book back to the very first page and began reading it in earnest. I couldn't tell you verbatim what was in those first however many entries. They were just mundane, two or three sentences about my aunt's day to day. Things like, went to the store today and got hit on by the cashier, or mom yelled at me today, not happy about that, or even managed to get a Sharon this morning, proud. About quarter of the way in, I found the first mention of R. It was an innocent sentiment, but it caught my attention. I found R again, hoping to catch up soon. He seems different. Everyone else up until that point had been mentioned by full name, first and last. Even my father, her brother, got the same treatment. The only exception so far had been Grandma, and even she from time to time got a name surrounded in parentheses next to a title. Not R though. R was always just a letter R, no matter what he was doing. R took me to the store today. It was nice to have company. My mum almost saw R out the window. How scary. R kissed me for the first time since back then today. It was by the river. These entries continued, 
innocent and soft, mixed amidst the hundreds of other ordinary days. The further I got into the journal, the more frequently mentions of R continued to pop up, until it was finally appearing on days he didn't even star in. R is so different now, I'm no longer afraid to admit that I'm in love with him, thinking of telling mom soon. It would have sounded sweet if it had not been for the next immediate sentence at the bottom of the page, right underneath it. I scanned over it three times before it really hit me, and when it did, the implications of it chilled me to the bone. He did it again. The following entry read, even when I said no this time. Desperate to understand what happened after that, I attempted to flip to the next page, but instead found a clump of them stuck together by a wet substance. It dripped down my hand, thick and black, the pink of the light doing nothing to soften the liquid. The book stubbornly forced me back to the original page it opened to, where it spoke of Juliet attempting to speak through a kiss. There was more added to it now, a mantra of nativity written over and over again almost spilled out from between the pages. The light, once casting the words into something passionate, now painted them violently. Loves me, loves me not, loves me, loves me not. My breath hitched in my throat. I held the book away from me, across the room. Whereas before the book landed softly, it now slammed against the floor with a crack as loud as a breaking skull. It screamed long and drawn out and pained. The pages flipped about in a ghastly wind, each shift of paper oozing out more of that thick and endless ink. I covered my ears and squeezed my eyes shut, but the screaming never stopped. Perhaps it wasn't smart to look away from what was happening, but by this point, you can probably tell I wasn't smart from the beginning. When I opened my eyes again, the pink light of the room had gone a deep red. Whatever liquid was spilling out of the diary had now started to leak out of every single book on my desk. The diary wailed and squirmed on the floor like a seizing body. I watched in horror as a hand started to crawl its way from between the pages. Long ligaments, only barely human enough to count as a finger, grasping at open air. Only when the wrist of the arm was visible and the fingers were pressed against the floor, was I able to toss myself out of the bed. I threw off the sheets and scrambled over towards the diary. Unthinking and relying only on instinctual fight response, I stomped on the hand with the full weight of my body. The screaming went shrill, and the hand retracted itself back into the diary. I slammed it shut and then picked it up, the leather of it so slippery and damp that it almost slid right back out of my grasp. I locked the diary away, and that's where it remains now, screaming in my hope chest, the padlock firmly shut. It almost feels ironic in a way, but I've stacked several heavier books amidst the other objects on top of it as well. Colourful sets of bleeding dictionaries that my grandma gave me to sell, but I've never gotten around to. I just hope they hold. The letters were scrawled under the lift's metal panel. Tiny black words. I had to squint to make them out. Press minus three three times to unlock the hidden floor. I snorted. The lift in my block of flats isn't exactly short of graffiti. But for the most part, it isn't worth a second look. Swear words, phone numbers, bulbous, badly drawn dicks. The kind of stuff bored teenagers scratch onto any available surface to amuse themselves. At least this new edition was original. I set down my two rubbish bags and pressed minus one. Hesitated with my finger hovering over the button. I don't know if I did what I did next in tribute to the graffiti's mystery author, or simply because I'd had a few post-work beers and felt the urge. Whatever the reason, I barely gave it any thought at all. 
I pushed the button twice more. It might have been the worst mistake I've ever made. The lift juddered into life. I flicked my gaze up to the digital display above the sliding metal doors, watching the numbers count down from 7, 6, 5, 4. I've always hated taking the bins out. Yes, I know, nobody enjoys doing it. Like cleaning or washing up, it's one of those chores that's pretty hard to get excited by. But something about the block of flats I live in makes the job even worse. It's not like being in a house where you can wander down the garden and pop your rubbish outside the back gate. Taking the bins out in my flat means going down to the bin room, down to the basement. Let me set the scene for you. The bin room is a tiny, claustrophobic box that's accessed through a sealed door in my building's lower car park. The reason it's sealed is because of the smell. The room stinks. I don't just mean in a, oh dear, this is a bit unpleasant kind of way. I mean the place is goddamn rotten. Black mold covers the ceiling, rat boxes hug the walls. There are about eight skips in there, and although half of them are meant to be used for recycling, nobody recycles. Even I don't. I tried at first, but it was like fighting a losing battle. Every skip is filled to the brim with black bin bags half of which are split and spilling their contents over the floor. I really hope God is reserving a spot in heaven for the people who empty that room every week, because let me tell you, those poor buggers deserve it. Three, two, one. By this point, I'd half forgotten about the graffitied instructions. I was already mentally holding my breath. I reached down and gripped the two rubbish bags ready to take the plunge. Zero. Minus one. For a moment, the display hovered on minus one, without doing anything. The lift whirred and whirred. I was having visions of being forced to use the emergency button to get building management to come and rescue me, when the thing finally lumbered to a stop. The lift let out a cheerful, ding, noise, and settled into place. The doors slid open. Oh shame, no hidden floor after all. I muttered the words to myself as I stepped out into the little no man's land that constitutes the basement foyer. God, the place is grim. Stained carpet, damp walls, more graffiti marks, mingling with patches of mold that creep down from the ceiling like dead flowers. Holding my breath, I walked to the left dumped one of my rubbish bags down and hit the door release button. Then I scooped the bag back up and made my way into the lower car park. Hearing my footsteps echo around the deserted space, I was suddenly reminded of the other reason I don't like doing the bins. It's kind of creepy down there. The basement level of my building is dark, no matter what time of day it is. There never seems to be anyone around. The size of the space has a weird effect on sound too. Doors shutting, the scrape of shoes over the concrete. Every noise has a light reverberation, as though it's being doubled. Walking around down there, it's all too easy to imagine you're being followed. In the interests of getting the job done quickly, I adopted my usual routine. I held my breath opened the door to the bin room with one hand and slung the rubbish bags through it without stepping foot inside. The noise of the bags crashing down amongst the rest of crap in there made me flinch. It sounded far too loud in the stillness. Dusting my hands off, I shut the door to the bin room and quickly made my way back across the car park. My footsteps echoed in the silence. A light breeze chilled my skin. I fumbled my building pass out my pocket and swiped it against the basement foyer door, then half jogged across the lobby area to push the lift button. The door to the lower car park snicked shut behind me. I shivered, doing my best not to look at the mold on the ceiling. I stared hard at the doors of the lift, willing them to open, 
trying to ignore the smell. After what seemed like a full minute, the familiar whirring noise started up again. The metal doors creaked, then began to slide apart. I felt my body turn cold. There was a man in the lift. He wore a dark suit and smart black shoes. I couldn't tell how old he was. Couldn't tell anything about what he looked like, in fact, because he wasn't facing me. He was standing in the far corner of the lift, facing the wall, not moving, completely silent. Now, I've seen a whole range of horror films in my 30 odd years, but for some reason, the sight of that man disturbed me more than any of them put together. I think it was two things. The shock of seeing someone in the lift at all, so soon after I'd left it, coupled with the fact that this guy was obviously cracked. He had to be, or so drunk he could barely stand. I took a step towards the lift. The man didn't move, and the more I stared at him, the more my mind began to dismiss the drunk theory. The guy didn't look like he'd been drinking. He wasn't slouched or leaned against the wall in a way drunk people do. He stood rigid, his back completely straight, his head level. You okay, mate? I regretted the words as soon as they were out. They were far too loud in the silence of the basement. I almost flinched at the sound of them. I watched the man's back closely. I expected some kind of reaction from him when I spoke. But there was none. Nothing. He stayed in exactly the same position as before, facing the corner of the lift, unmoving. It was at this point that I made my second biggest mistake. I walked into the lift with him and pressed the button for my floor. I still don't understand why I did it. What the hell was I thinking? I could have climbed the stairs instead. That's what I should have done. But for some reason, possibly because I lived so high up in the building, maybe because I just didn't want to admit how freaked out I was, I stepped in. The man remained where he was. The lift whirred around me, and then the doors rolled shut. I felt my heart pick up as the lift began its slow climb. The space was cramped, and I stood as far away from the strange man as I could. My back pressed against the control panel, one eye on him, one eye on the digital display above the lift's doors. Zero, one, two. My hands were slick with sweat. The only sound in the lift was the gentle whir of the mechanism. My heart thumped in my chest. I kept flicking my gaze between the doors and the stranger, willing the lift to hurry. But it seemed to be taking far longer than usual. Three, four, five. It was as the lift hit the sixth floor that I heard it. The noise, a soft, gentle hiss, like escaping steam. At first I thought it was the lift's mechanism making the sound, but a few moments later I realised I was wrong. It was coming from the direction of my fellow passenger. I stared at him, my heartbeat punching in my chest. That's when I saw movement, not from his body, that remains completely still, but from the lower half of his head. I couldn't see his face, but from my angle, I could just make out the side of his jaw. It twitched back and forth rapidly. The man was whispering under his breath. The lift dinged. I bit my lip to stop myself crying out. Heat pricked every inch of my skin. As the lift jutted and whirred, the man's whispering grew louder. It sounded like he was muttering a string of nonsense sounds. The 
the same noises over and over again in a never-ending loop. Wastaka beyonder, wastaka beyonder, wastaka beyonder. I shuffled as close to the lift's entrance as I could. The mechanism whirred and clanked, but the doors remained shut. Come on, for goodness sake. My heartbeat was up in my neck now, a relentless drumbeat. The man's whispering grew louder. He started putting more emphasis on certain words, almost spitting them. A fraction of a second before the doors opened, I finally made out what he was saying. And it sent a chill down the length of my back. Wasta can be under. Wasta can be under. Wasta can be under. That one phrase spoken so fast again and again that the words blur together. What's done can't be undone. The doors rumbled open behind me. I hurried from the lift. Behind me, the man's whispering stopped. When I glanced back once before I rounded the corner, he was standing in the exact same position, facing the corner of the lift, his body still. I drank a lot that night. After making sure my front door was locked, as well as each of the windows, I went to the fridge and scooped out all the beers I could find. Then I sat in front of the TV and knocked them back one after the other. By the time I finally stumbled into my room, throwing my clothes in a pile on the floor and passing out on the bed, it was well after midnight. I woke a short while later. I must have been having nightmares, because I dragged myself out of sleep in that horrible, lurching way you do after a bad dream. You know, when it feels like you've been holding your breath and you're finally coming up for air. I lay on my side in the bed, panting in the darkness. My mouth felt like cotton. The room was silent around me. I reached out a hand towards my bedside table, fumbling in the darkness until I finally found a lamp. I flicked the switch. Weak yellow light bathed the room. It was empty. I saw the familiar shapes of my furniture in the gloom, but nothing else. I let out a breath that I hadn't realized I'd been holding. Of course the room was empty. I'd had a nightmare, that was all. That was what had woken me up. You're working yourself up over nothing. I told myself in the darkness, acting like a ten years old again. But no matter what I said to myself, what my rational mind knew to be true, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease in my stomach. I turned over and lay on my back, trying to clear my mind. It wasn't easy. My ears suddenly seemed to have become sensitive to every tiny noise in the flat. The drip of the tap in the kitchen a creak of pipes behind the walls, the faint hum of traffic drifting in from the road outside, and something else too, a soft, distant humming sound, almost like a whisper. Don't, I told myself, don't do it. But lying in the twilight of my room, it seemed my mind had other ideas. The more I tried to relax, the more I kept conjuring images from my encounter in the lift. The metal door sliding back, the man in the suit, his jaw twitching back and forth as he whispered the same words over and over. What's done can't be undone. I swung my legs out of bed. If my mind was going to refuse to play ball, I wasn't going to indulge it. No way. I'd get up, stretch my legs, and go get myself a glass of water. I might not be able to force myself to relax, but I could at least take care of my dry mouth. I padded barefoot across the floor. The light from my bedside lamp faded behind me as I entered the hall. 
the plink, plink, plink from the tap grew louder. Up ahead, I could see the kitchen door, a faint outline in the darkness. My feet whispered across the carpet, and there was another sound too. The same noise I'd heard a moment earlier lying in bed. As I continued down the hall, I realized it was growing louder. That soft humming. A quiet noise that was so terribly close to a whisper. It was coming from the kitchen. For a moment, I had the urge to go back, to simply retreat to the lamplit room of my bedroom, but I dismissed it. I wasn't going to let fear get the better of me. Ignoring the growing unease in my stomach, I walked through the kitchen door and flicked on the light, and I let out another long breath. The humming noise was coming from the fridge. That was all. It wasn't a whisper at all. It was only the soft whir of my fridge's compressor. I should have recognized the sound as soon as I heard it. Shaking my head, I grabbed a glass from the cupboard, filled it up at the sink, and downed the contents in one. Then I filled it one more time and flicked the kitchen light off. Heading back towards the glow of my bedroom, I started feeling tired again. My mind was beginning to slow down. I'd had a scare earlier, that was true. An odd encounter with some weirdo that would, in all likelihood, have freaked anyone out. But now it was time to let it go. I had work the following day, and I didn't need to be losing any more sleep over nothing. I walked back through the door of my bedroom, rubbing my eyes. My foot knocked into the pile of clothes I'd left on the floor the night before. I opened my eyes, planning to kick them to one side, and saw a shape in my peripheral vision. I screamed. The man from the lift stood in the corner of my room. In the lamp's weak glow, he was nothing more than a shadow, a dark shape standing stationary among the other dark shapes, facing the wall completely still, just like before. The glass of water slipped from my hand. I heard it smashing onto the floor, but the noise seemed to come from a long way away. Cold liquid splattered my legs, the sensation cutting through the worst of my shock. I turned to run. As I twisted towards my door, my feet tangled in the pile of clothes and I went down, hard on the carpet. My knee flared with agony. I pushed myself back up, ignoring the pain, and sprinted from the room as fast as I could. I caught one final glimpse of the man before I skidded into the hallway on my way to the front door. He was still frozen, in the exact same position, a living statue. I don't really know what my plan was. As I wrenched open the latch of my front door and fled into the hallway, wearing only my boxer shorts, I had nothing but terror in my head. Black fear. My feet carried me away from the flat, away from the stranger of my bedroom, and I let them. But my instinct must have been working on some level. Less than 30 seconds after fleeing my bedroom, I found myself standing in front of the lift, my finger hammering repeatedly on the call button. And for once, the lift didn't have to drag itself from the ground floor. The doors opened straight away. I think at that point, I was only trying to get as far away from the silent man as I could. My finger darted towards the zero button on the metal panel. But at the last minute, I stopped myself. It was the graffiti that did it. The writing was still there. Those familiar, tiny black letters. But the words had changed. It was subtle, but I noticed it straight away. Now, instead of reading, press minus three three times to unlock the hidden floor. The words read, press minus three three times to seal the hidden floor. 
My eyes lingered on the words for a second, making certain. Then, I punched the button so hard, my finger hurt. Three times. I shut my eyes and prayed. All of this happened last night. The trip to the bin room, the man in the lift, the same man standing silently in my room. The images won't leave my head. The fear hasn't gone away either. I love to say that it's all over now. That I can tell you this story safe in the knowledge that my ordeal has finished. But I can't say that. I'd only be lying to myself. At first, I thought the graffiti instructions had put things back to normal. I thought I'd fix things. I took the stairs from the basement up to the ground floor lobby of my block of flats, then waited there in my boxes until the cold numbed the worst of my fear. Eventually, I crept back upstairs. The door to my flat was wide open, just as I'd left it. The hall beyond was dark. I tiptoed along it, the fear seeping back into me like cold water telling myself over and over again that everything would be okay now. I followed the instructions after all. The man would be gone. And he was. I rounded the corner of my bedroom, skin coated in goosebumps. And there was nobody there. I let out a long, shaky breath. The stranger had left. Or at least... I thought he'd left. Now, sitting in my flat, as the sky outside begins to lose its light, I'm not so sure at all. I keep thinking I've caught glimpses of him, see? It's been happening over and over again throughout the day. Everywhere I go, I see him. In the distance on the street, in crowds, in my commute to work this morning, standing at the far end of the train carriage. I see him in reflections too. Just quick glimpses, there and gone again. I know how that sounds, but it's true. It's like his shadow's following me. In the bathroom mirror this morning, as I was getting ready for work, in the windows of cars passing me on the street, as I bent down to wash my hands in the sink at lunchtime, I even thought I caught a glimpse of him in the shining metal of the tap. I spun around, heart jackhammering in my chest, but there was nobody there. And then, there are the whispers. His whispers. At various points in the day, I found myself sitting still, mind-wandering, and it's like I hear them out of nowhere. That same phrase again and again, hissing in my ear. What's done can't be undone. What's done can't be undone. What's done can't be undone. More and more, I find myself suspecting there might be some truth to that. I think I may have triggered something when I pressed the button in the lift yesterday, tapped into some unimaginable gateway that I have no way of shutting. The thing really did it. The final thing that made me certain I haven't seen the last of the silent stranger was what I found in the lift when I returned home from work. What happened to the graffiti and the metal control panel? The words from yesterday were still there. The instructions for sealing the hidden floor. But now, they've been crossed out. Scribbled over in red pen. And whoever had done it, had added the following shaky message. The doors cannot be sealed until all passengers are inside. Back when I was a little kid, I'd sometimes wake in the middle of the night. I wouldn't be able to get back to sleep again. I'd lie with my eyes open, staring into the never-ending darkness, and I'd imagine that every shadow was a monster out to get me. But now I don't have to imagine. Now I don't need my mind to twist innocuous shapes into ghosts and demons. Because this monster is real.
and I have a feeling he'll be back to visit me again soon. God, it must have been horrible lying down here for weeks. I gave Jesse a withering look as he got up to change the water in his bucket. When he saw that both Mrs. Janice and I were sharing an uncomfortable silence, he tried to act as if nothing had happened. But the effort was clumsy. I bought him a mobile phone, the old woman said, her voice mousy and tired. He just wouldn't keep the damn thing on him. If he perhaps... No need to explain, I replied. It's just, I tried to see him whenever I could, but he wasn't a nice... You don't owe anyone an explanation, I said, trying my best to appear empathetic and non-judgmental. We're just here to clean up and help out. Now, if there's anything else we need to know, I think it's time we got on with things on our end, and you can carry on with your day. Oh, she said, as I took her by the arm and started walking her out of the bedroom. Oh, there is one more thing. She turned from me and walked towards a small cupboard door beneath the stairs. There's a small basement down here where it's got a few more things boxed up. Look, the key's just in the lock, ready to go. She opened the door and gestured downwards. It's awfully dark, so if you haven't brought any torches, I can... Oh, don't worry about that. We bring plenty of light in case something happens with the electrics. I said, we'll make sure to clear the basement out. Is there anything in particular down there that you might want to keep? If you find any photos, can you put them aside? Of course. I smiled before taking her to the door and saying my goodbyes. After she left, I went back and looked down the tiny basement stairway and made a mental note of when and how it would be best to approach that part of the job. I found Jesse in the downstairs bedroom where he was still on his hands and knees, scrubbing away at the faintly human-stained shape on the floor. We had already disposed of the rectangular section of carpet that Mr. Rittle had lain upon, and now we faced the daunting task of trying to clear out any seepage that had soiled the underlying wood floor. Sorry about that, Jessie said when I came in. It just slipped my mind and I forgot she was standing there. I know it wasn't very professional, but it's just... it's weird, you know. It's alright, I said running my dusty hands through my hair. Just be careful. If she hadn't already paid us a deposit, that could have cost us the gig. You're right, he replied. I've done this job for long enough. I should know better. Yeah, but to be fair, this is... Mr. Rittle was unique to us in a few ways. Not only had he died a horrific and messy death, but he had a strange fixation of acquiring other people's garbage and his enormous 43-bedroom manor was filled with trash he'd bought and stolen from anyone he could find. There was no rhyme or reason to what he kept or why. All around me stood stacks of misshapen books and stolen bin bags interlaced with leaflets and old food wrappers. Looking to my left, I saw a bent and rusty nail framed with the Roman numerals CLXXIX engraved in the wood, while on my right was a small cluster of toenails arranged in descending of thickness. This is something else, I said, finally finishing my sentence. When are the others arriving? Pinny texted me 15 minutes ago to say they were on their way, but Jay's still on holiday, Jesse replied, standing up to change the bucket once again. Walking over, I took a long look at the stain, pausing briefly to kneel down and examine a slight pitting in the floor, almost as if jabbed the wooden floorboards with a knife over and over. Seeing me fixated on the floor, Jesse returned and said, Yeah, it's slow progress. Aye, I agreed. But still progress. Keep at it. I unearthed the first painting behind a pile of laundry as tall as a man. The sodden, moldy clothes had rotted much of the canvas, spoiling the painting until it looked like a psychedelic nightmare. Despite the coverage, or perhaps because of it, the subject looks all the more haunting. It was a church, the outline dissolving into shadow black mold. Alone, standing unusually tall by the front door, was the figure 
of barely visible men painted blacker than black, glistening through the canvas like liquid obsidian. The paint looked so fresh as to be wet, and I hesitated and stopped myself before I touched it out of mindless curiosity. Holding it, I suddenly felt watched in the cramped confines of the towering filth. I turned to check the doorway behind me, and for some reason, I frightened myself by imagining the painted man standing in the corridor. It was a silly thing to daydream, but it bothered me nonetheless, and when I put the painting aside, I made sure to turn it facing towards the wall. Over the next few days, four paintings were found. The second was discovered by Pinny, who brought it over with a disgruntled expression. While he was usually untalkative, something about his silence on this occasion struck me as somber and depressed. When I asked if he'd looked at it, he answered, without stopping to talk to me as he made his way back upstairs. Bloody hideous thing. I took a quick peek myself and was startled by the faint impression of something juddering towards me through the frame. In fact, I was simply looking at a copy of the same painting I had found, except the perspective had moved closer towards the church, enlarging the subjects and creating, in my mind, the illusion of movement. A proper look revealed that the image was static. What else did I expect? And while the figure and church door were shrouded in the usual darkness, the mold and filth had done unusual things to the spires of the church, lending them a subtle fleshy quality. That same day, Jesse was found being sick next to the third and fourth paintings that were found as a pair. Quietly, I moved the canvases aside to avoid further damage and checked him out to make sure he was okay. He was insistent that it was the intense smell coming from a jar of pickled something he'd dropped. But when I looked at the two paintings he'd found, I came to suspect otherwise. Much like the others, they were of the same subject, each one bringing the church and painted man closer and closer to the viewer in a most unpleasant way. Slowly, the pastor came into focus until the blackness was broken with tiny flecks of detail. A squarish bit of off-white for a face, two long, needle-like stabs for hands, and the tiniest fleck of red beneath his feet. As the man came closer with each new painting, so too did the church and mold merge to create an increasingly surreal architecture. By the final painting, its spires looked like tumorous growths of bone and meat, standing unnaturally tall against an alien sky of red and violet bruises that burst across the canvas. It reminded me of every piece of rotten flesh I'd ever seen, and I felt a visual urge to look away. After that, I sent Jesse home for the day, suspecting that the paintings had affected him quite severely. When he returned the next morning, he was quiet and baggy-eyed. Penny suggested to me that he'd been drinking, but I had a good feeling something else was playing on his mind. After all, I'd cleaned up that jar and seen the cabbage-headed fetus he'd been holding, and I knew the paintings were just one strange facet of this job. I started to wonder if it was sensible to leave each of us alone as we burrowed through this unnatural horde. It's like we're journeying through someone else's madness, Jesse said one lunch, and surprisingly, Pinny gave a nod of agreement. I found a piece of paper today that just read, everything here has taken a life, and I can't stop wondering if it's true, or if he just thought it was true, or if it's a joke, or a prediction, or what. How does a toenail take a life? I asked. Infection? Penny suggested gruffly. My grandfather died because his belt loop caught in a door handle, and it went straight over him, turning at the hip, and whacked his head on the floor. He was so scared of the drop, he had a heart attack. Jesse let out a tapered snicker, but immediately covered it with his hand. A moment later, and I let out a chuckle, and then, not long after, so did Penny. He just went over like a windmill, Penny added after the laughter had died down, before adding, as if it was some important reassurance. Jay will be here tomorrow. We can get through this job even faster with him. Something about the absurdity of that lunch had calmed me, and I returned to work, feeling a little more grounded. Except bad luck would have it, 
that barely an hour after our conversation, I found the fifth painting. At first, I tried not to look at it, but I couldn't help myself. I'd put it against the wall and continued working, but my every movement felt watched. I could feel it there, behind me. Every time I bent down to grab something off the floor, some instinctual alarm went off and I would snap up alert as if expecting something to... I don't know. I felt like a kid taking a long walk home as the sun was setting on a winter afternoon, briskly moving between each streetlight, terrified that something would snatch me from the shadows in between. After I nearly dropped a whole box of milk bottles, I was forced to admit that I was letting my imagination get the better of me, and I finally leaned the painting back to get a good look at it. As I did, the light from above fell across it in one smooth movement, the shadow withdrawing like a pulled curtain, and I swear that figure shut it out of the background and right up to the very front of the painting, his whole face taking up the window of the canvas. I cried out, let go of the frame, and it fell backwards with a thud of a church bell. The pastor's face was leering up at me, a strange impression of a misshapen milky head framed by a sturdy brimmed black hat, the face devoid of any real detail as if seen through a cataract, and yet it radiated hate. A pencil thin mouth sneering at me through the incohesive brush strokes. I was shaking when I pulled it back up, and much to my shame, I later asked a passing Jesse to take it down to the others because I was too busy. I couldn't quite bring myself to touch it again, not after I noticed the wet paint against the wall where it had been leaning. I assumed you'd been painting them, Jay said holding the canvas with both hands. When I'd heard he'd found one just a few hours into his first day at the house, I felt a lurch in my stomach, but was relieved to find it wrapped top to bottom in brown wrapping paper, a thin piece of string tying it all together. In one corner was a label with Mr. Riddle's address. Could be a different one, Jesse said. Should we look? Jay asked. Before he'd begun working in the morning, Penny had taken him aside and shown him the paintings. Jay had yet to speak about their effect on him, but I could clearly see a fear in his eyes as he'd asked whether we wanted to look at the sixth canvas. I think we have to, Jesse said. We've seen the others. No, I replied with a shake of my head, and both Jay and Penny voiced their agreement, but Jesse piped up. It's probably not even the same one. For all we know, this was a Christmas gift. You guys can't be serious, can you? We really need to look at it. For the life of me, I couldn't understand Jesse's angle, and I dismissed any argument and instead instructed Jay to take the painting down with the others while I kept Jesse busy on the upper floors. Personally, I felt immense relief to know the painting was hidden from us, for we were barely eight rooms into the house, and I already felt emotionally drained in a way that begged to give up on the job, and something about Jesse wanting to open it unsettled me. He'd never had a ghoulish streak before. Did he not feel the same repulsion that the rest of us did? When the day ended, he came to and asked once more if he could look, and I told him no. I ignored his complaints and told him he needed to keep his head focused on the task ahead, try my best to emphasize the money we'd be paid for doing it. He nodded a faint agreement when I reminded him about his upcoming wedding, but as I watched him stagger to his car, I wondered if I'd made any impact on him at all. When he didn't come in the following day, I initially thought he'd just taken the day off. Normally, I would have been furious, but I believed he had good reason on this occasion. Having spoken to Pinny and Jay, it was clear we were all finding this job unusually stressful and I hoped that when Jesse returned, he might bring back good energy to raise all our spirits. Except, at the end of the day, as I was locking up, I went to check on the reception area where the paintings were kept, and noticed that the latest one in its brown wrapping paper was stacked at a slight angle. I approached it 
and felt a knot in my throat when I saw a fold of torn paper stuffed between it and the canvas beside it. By the time I leaned back, my stomach was in my throat and I found no relief at what I found. The paper had been torn open, revealing the painting within, except now there was just the church door rendered in peculiar childlike detail. Around the edges, veins of corruption curled just out of sight, like bloody smoke, but there was no pastor, no grim-faced spectre standing guard. I reached out and touched the slimy paint and saw that it was still wet and wiped it away on a nearby desk. As I did so, I found something rather alarming on the floor. With everything being moved around, it was hard to say if the scratches in the wood were new or old, but I left the darkening house as quickly as I could. Looking up at it in my rearview mirror, only when I felt that I was far enough down the driveway to be safe, and yet I still nearly veered off the road at the sight of a dark figure standing by the door. Of course, by the time I straightened up the wheel and steadied the car, I checked and nothing was standing there. I told myself it was just my imagination. But when the morning came, I was not surprised to find out Jesse had failed to turn up to work. We found no more paintings after that day, but Jay, Penny and I continued to work under an increasingly anxious mood. Together, we had no problem avoiding the paintings and I desperately hoped that would be the end of the weirdness. But I quickly realized how wrong I was, for nearly every room had a litany of bizarre and unsettling finds. There were scrapbooks filled with bloody clothes, strange words carved into the walls, mirrors with delayed reflections, but they were the least of it. The worst was the sex doll. In all my years clearing out hoarder's homes, Unpleasant stuff like that was incredibly common. When Jay first radioed in, telling everyone he found a homemade doll, I almost felt a kind of relief. It almost felt like something we'd expect in a normal place. But even a simple cursory look at the thing made of padded foam and old women's clothes, all covered with uncomfortable rust brown stains, had me questioning Jay's conclusion. Before I could say anything, Penny spoke up. Where's its mouth? Are you sure it's wise to be touching it? I added. Gotta have a strong stomach for this job. He told me that on the first day, Jay said. I mean, it's a sex doll, right? It has to be. He's an old man with urges and... And... It was an absurd facsimile of a woman. A misshapen lump of green, blue and purple padded foam cut haphazardly into a misshapen hourglass figure like an amateur mannequin. For a face, it had a porcelain mask shaped like the image of a geisha, except instead of a demure, thin-lipped smile, there was a clownish, red-lipped snarl behind lurid, spherical eyes. They were carved with great anatomical detail, glaring at me with the wide-eyed excitement of a nightmarish gargoyle. Set above them was a molten brow that sagged into an exaggerated frown. There's no actual holes, Penny remarked picking the thing up and turning it head over heels. Damn it, he cried out, startling Jay and I and dropping the doll with the mask thudded against the floor. There's something sharp in it, he groaned before sucking on his wounded thumb. Gently, Jay and I picked it up. I briefly noted a small chip above the brow where it had fallen and carefully turned it over and examined it until I identified a long sliver of metal embedded in the doll's thigh resisting all efforts to remove it. The needle was pitted with rust, and the tip was the slightest hint of a pearlescent shimmer that winked violet and crimson as I turned it over in the light. I can't get the damn thing out. We need to be careful handling this thing. And Pinslow, I added, you need to look into getting a tetanus shot. Infected by a sex doll? Jay cried out, his whinnying laugh like nails on chalk. That'll raise some eyebrows. It's not a damn sex doll, you idiot, Penny swore, still smarting from the wound. It hasn't got any holes for, for, well, you know. Well, Jay muttered, 
holding the doll up once more so she stood amongst us, her inhuman face making uncomfortable eye contact with me. What else is she? He asked, and I realised his voice was not petulant, but pleading. He genuinely wanted an answer. I think we all did. I was coming into work a little later than usual, and I noticed something unusual. The doll had been pulled out of the skip and placed next to it, her eyes drinking in the barren garden that surrounded the home. For a moment, I paused and momentarily wondered if somehow the expression on the doll's face had changed to a grin. But then again, she looked different in the full daylight, and I shook the thought from my head. Barely a second later, and Pinny strode out, his arms full with an old television that he threw into the skip with glee. Without speaking, I gestured to the doll. Reminds me of Maria Lewis, he said with a gruff laugh. Same size, same shape, and just like Maria, she's got a nasty bite. He held up his thumb, and I grimaced at the open wound throbbing just beneath his nail. Christ, I scoffed at the joke. Well, just like Maria, she's destined for the bin. She deserved better than that, Penny replied, going silent for a moment too long before appearing to remember that I was still there. Maria, that is, the real one, not that thing. Shall we put it in the skip now? I asked. No, we should put the heavy stuff in first. I'll chuck her in later. For a moment, I was about to argue that the doll would barely make a difference to the skip's weight distribution, but I decided to let the older Pinny's judgement stay in effect. And yet, a day later, when the skip was loaded out for a new one and driven past me, I couldn't help but notice the doll was not in it. She was standing beside the door, her mouth cast in a downward expression of theatrical sorrow. Did you do this? I asked Pinny as he passed me by the doorway. Do what? Changed her face? No, he answered innocently. How would I do that? Just make sure she's in the next one. Sorry, he cried out with an affected wince. I forgot about her. Still, she's hardly hurting anyone, is she? Pinny carried on walking casually, as if it was an honest mistake, but briefly stopped to readjust the doll's unkempt wig without a second thought. Just make sure she's gone tomorrow, I shouted after him, to which he merely waved his hand in acknowledgement, as though there was nothing to worry about. I hoped that was true, but when lunchtime came and we all gathered outside, I noticed that the doll was missing. Some kids were eyeing her up, Penny said when asked before gesturing to an upper story window. Now the doll was leering down at us with a barely visible expression of joy. Figured we can't let them get hold of her, especially if we never got that dirty needle out. She's upstairs? Jay asked. In a room. Mum won't let me speak to her though. I don't know why. We left the disco holding hands and now... Penny trailed off into a heavy silence, and Jay and I gave each other a funny look. Unwilling to press the awkward silence any further, we ate the rest of our lunch without speaking. I later asked Jay to check Penny's van for the usual flask, but he came back empty-handed, and I was left wondering if something else was going on with the older man. Sure enough, when the day was over, I went to check on Penny and found him sitting next to the doll, elbows on his knees and his head buried in his hands. I stood in the doorway for a moment, hesitating to speak. Are you... okay? Just tired is all, he answered, looking up at me with bloodshot eyes. And this damn hand of mine is killing. The infection from his thumb had spread along his wrist. I was making progress towards his forearm. The skin looked shiny and tight, close to bursting, and I told him he ought to take the following day off. Can't do that, he growled. Got too much to do. Besides, he added with an almost drunken slur slouching upwards to put his arms around the doll. I've got to walk Maria home. You'd think I might have forgotten her until now, but no. She's been in my thoughts every single night since it happened. Didn't even go to her funeral. But 
I never forget. She's in my thoughts more than anyone else's. Quietly, Penny burped and closed his eyes. A thick robe of drool making stalactites down his chest. Without waking him, I reached out and took the doll and carried it downstairs, leaving the poor man asleep on the box he was sitting on. Once outside, I threw the offending thing in with the rest of the rubbish, and just to add insult to injury, I grabbed some nearby bin bags and hurled them on top of the doll, feeling satisfied that the job was finally done. I found Penny where I'd left him and went to shake him awake when he lashed out with terrible speed. It were different back then, he cried, his swollen hand snapping out to clutch my wrist with iron strength. I cried out and pulled back, but he held on firm, that unbearably hot palm sending shivers up my spine. It looked like the hand of a bloated corpse, and I saw that his forehead was drenched in sweat and his eyes were burning with delirium. We didn't know much back then as boys, and we were always taught that girls would lead you on strange games before getting to the point. She never said no, he hissed, his expression pleading with me in desperation. It took me years to realize, to understand why she'd done it and the part I played. But what had happened weren't at all like I imagined, like what movies show you. I didn't know, didn't think. It weren't until I saw the way her ma looked at me when the first seeds of doubt settled in. Suddenly, the fire within him died and he sat back on the box, falling asleep, almost as if he was under a spell. Shaking, I pulled my hand free and turned to see Jay standing in the doorway with an ashen white face. Did you see that? I asked incredulously. But he ignored me, saying instead, I think I found the others. Other what? I asked. Come see. I left Penny slouched over himself and followed Jay to a small room one story up from where I'd been. Slowly, he opened a door to reveal a cluttered display room with a horseshoe-shaped arrangement of cabinets and boxes, all draped in colourful bedsheets. One of the sheets had been pulled back to reveal a horrible sculpture. It was a porcelain mask with ten needle-tipped limbs sprouting from the centre. Its face twisted into a drunken grin. It had the same features as the doll, except with a very different expression. Looks like something a school shooter would make in a metal shop, Jay grumbled. The legs are just welded bike chains and knitting needles filed down to a point. I didn't reply. It was hard for me to repress my arachnophobia in the presence of those two feet wide monstrosities. There was a busyness to the arrangement of their legs that worked its way right under my skin. Look, there are others. Jay said, pulling a second sheet away to reveal another mask nearly identical to the last, barring the expression. They creep me out. You're telling me, I muttered before pulling away another sheet. Huh? I grunted at the sight of the smashed glass and empty display. What's wrong? When he saw what I saw, he added, Do you think someone stole it? Silently, we pulled away all the remaining sheets until all 12 display cases were revealed. Six of them had been smashed and three of the sculptures were gone. But in one of the open cases, I saw that a mask had been returned. Both Jay and I crowded around it and stared in disbelief. Is that... blood? Jay asked, pointing to one of its legs. It looked like a quill dipped in dried crimson ink. Slowly, I raised my eye to the face and took a sharp inward take of breath. There was a grossly familiar chip on the brow. You don't think... Jay started to ask, but I walked away before he could finish. Silently, I went to the window and he followed, leaning over my shoulder to look down at the skip in the driveway. Impossibly, the doll was sitting on top of the pile of bin bags. With a terrible, stuttering motion, it turned its head to look back at us. How's he doing? Jay asked. 
I had just come from the hospital to check on Penny, where he said some worrying things during my time beside him. He is okay, I replied, just delirious from the fever. And no sign of that thing in the skip? Could he have been the one? I don't know, I replied. I just don't know. I saw it move, Jay said, and for a moment his words were left hanging in the air until I finally responded. Me too. I did something bad, Jay said, his voice almost mute. Do you remember years back, my first few days with you? Do you remember finding all that copper in my van? What did you take? I asked, guessing where things were going. Shaking, Jay reached down to the plastic bag at his feet. Instead of removing his lunch, like I expected, he pulled out a large, clunky, Polaroid camera. I thought it was a joke, or it was broken, or I was just... I thought I might have been going mad, but after that thing we saw yesterday, I'm starting... What if it's not? Penny had binned it, he said. But that's not the point. It's what it... Look, he grabbed a handful of Polaroids from the same bag as the camera and handed them to me. One by one, I shuffled through them like a pack of cards, but saw nothing except slight variations of a barren desert floor, looking like something you'd expect a rover on Mars to send back. What of it? I asked. I took those out here, facing the garden, he replied. I thought it was busted, but, well... Look at this. Holding the camera in both hands, Jay took a photo and we waited as it printed. And yet, the picture that came out was much the same as the others he held. I don't get... Now look, he told me, as if turning to face the house and took another picture. A few seconds later, he handed me the photo. What the hell is this? Honestly, Jay stammered. It wasn't until I brought the camera back because, you know, I felt bad and I was putting it back in the skip when I must have dropped it and hit the button and it took a photo and, and, you saw this? Yes, it happened this morning. I've been holding onto it all day and I was going to tell you when you got back from visiting Penny but I'm still not sure I can make heads or tails of what I'm seeing. It looks like the church out of those paintings, I said. Or something like it, I think. The photo showed a bright white sky, devoid of all features, with a towering building looming over the frame, too large for any sense of height to be gauged. That's not the worst of it, Jay grimaced. Here, I took this earlier. Jay took another white photo from his inside pocket and showed it to me. It was very similar to the last one, close to identical, except for the clearly visible form of Jesse standing behind one of the second story windows. And he was not alone. He's gone, I said as I laid all four paintings out. Somehow they had gotten worse. Their frames and canvases consumed by a throbbing mold there was a riotous explosion of colours, and yet, despite the growth, the church was still visible in at least three of the images, and the doorway was plainly empty of the painted figure. From beside me came the sudden and loud flash of the camera, and I turned to see Jay shaking a Polaroid while he waited for it to develop. When it finally developed, we saw a rotten, crumbling version of the same hallway we stood in, knife-like lances of desert sun blasting through open cracks in the walls and smashed windows. All the wood was sagging and in a rank state of decay, while most of the trash had turned to ash and dust. But most odd was the roll of fabric, turned into a makeshift bed on the floor, a tally scratched into the wood that counted to 13, and a series of tin cans laid out with water in them. Sharing a brief look, Jay and I agreed to go upstairs where we slowly began mapping our way through the house. It was a peculiar and alien experience, marking out the broken floors and collapsed rooms, discombobulated to find we were climbing stairs shown to be completely destroyed in the photographs. But 
there were subtle signs of habitation, including recently disturbed footprints and barricaded doors. Carefully, we followed them until we reached the room where Jesse had been standing. However, when we took a photograph, we found only an empty window, piles of sharpened sticks lying beside it. It wasn't until we took a photo of the doorway we'd just passed through that I saw Jesse standing alone, glaring down the hallway with terror etched on his face. I felt a flare of urgency and ran out into the same hallway. I felt helpless, unsure of what to do, until I did the only thing I could and took a photo of the corridor. The picture that printed was horrifying, showing a lonely stretch of hall that broke suddenly into open air. Standing there, leering through the open hole, was a grotesque face, hauntingly reminiscent of the masks we had found. Whatever wore that visage was a monstrous thing, for the features were rendered upon a towering giant. When I took a photo of the space behind me, Jesse had gone, fleeing just out of sight. I turned and stamped another, and nearly jumped at the sight of that horrible face looming through the corridor, its hairy head and neck squeezed ineffectually into the small space, filling the corridor with shadow as it tried to force its way forward. What's it doing? Jay asked. I took another, saw that the thing had moved forward by a few inches, snapping wood and buckling the floors. Now, one of its hands was stretched outwards, as if to grab something. I don't understand, he said. Is it reaching for Jesse? No, I muttered. He's gone. What's it reaching for? Jay said again, taking an uneasy step forward. I took another photo and saw that the giant was now just a few feet from where I stood. Something about its eyes, those round, hungry, glistening orbs with small, harsh pupils and no irises, terrified me. But it was nothing compared to what I felt when I realized that its face had been lit up by the flash of the camera. It's reaching for us, I said, my words immediately followed by the sound of Jay fleeing hysterically down the stairs. Jay, I screamed, turning a corner to find the basement door beneath the stairs swinging open on its hinges. I ran up to it, but hesitated at the first step. Jay, I cried again, hoping to God he'd reply to me from anywhere but down there. And yet, as soon as the last of my echoes rang out into the dark, Jay let out a terrible shriek from deep within the basement. I took a deep breath to steady my nerves and descended. It was more normal than I might have expected. Rows and rows of shelves had been laid out and filled with the usual rubbish that Mr. Rittle enjoyed so much. Jars of fermenting medical curiosities, boxes of stolen Christmas decorations, ornamental gnomes with mud still caked on their feet. There was nothing down there that, at first glance, might be responsible for Jay's disappearance. But that earthen chamber was bigger than I first thought. The first room was typical in size, but one corner was a jagged hole cut into the soil, which led into another similarly sized room. And then there was another, and another, and another. Until then, I'd believed the manor house to be an impenetrable nightmare, but it turned out to just be the tip of the iceberg. I soon found new stairs, leading to lower floors, haphazardly dug into the very peat itself. Nothing was empty. There was no spare room, and it was on the third set of stairs that I realized the rooms were getting larger, and I had taken such an unusual series of twists and turns that meant I couldn't be sure what the way back was. I started to wonder whether it would be okay to just leave, but I called out Jay's name one more time, just in case. No one replied, and in a final effort, I swung the camera around from my neck and took a photo of the basement. Unlike before, it did not show me anything at all like the place I was standing in. In fact, this was a perfect replica of the very first painting I found in the manor. I had come to understand that the camera showed some alternate, 
or perhaps future version of the place I stood. But if it did, then nothing about this last picture made any sense. I took another and grimaced to see that the painted figure had somehow appeared in the doorway of the church. Nothing about it corresponded to my location, and I came to realize that if the camera had any kind of logical rules, it wasn't anything I could understand. Feeling all hope wane, I took one last photo and saw that the painted figure had lunged forward, moving closer to the camera's point of view. I decided to take no more and let the photo fall to the floor. Hesitantly, I turned, getting ready to leave and call the police when I faced the stairway with my torch and revealed a person standing at the top. Their face was obscured by something strange that glinted in my light. Something metallic or ceramic, but the outfit clearly belonged to Jay. Jay? I stepped forward, seeing how ragged and torn his clothes were, glimpsing his pallid torso coated in drying blood. Jay, are you okay? I asked. But he stood there, shaking jerkily with his head twisted up to face the ceiling. Something was hovering over his face, and his neck was bulging and throbbing as if his Adam's apple had swollen and was roaming free. When he lowered his head, it was with unnatural speed. What happened was so fast, I barely had time to process it. Pouring through the images in my mind as I later ran through the labyrinth corridors of shelves while my chest burned in desperate need of air. No matter what, the sight had been enough to send me running away without any need of comprehension. It was only later that my thoughts coalesced and I realized he had glared at me with the face of the masked doll. His movements down the stairs were erratic and clumsy and if he hadn't fallen, he may very well have caught me then and there. As he skidded face first down the lumpy steps, I saw a glistening mechanism of metallic legs and clicking gears bloodily jammed into his broken, distended jaw. Blood gurgled from his swollen tongue and lips. Something had been forced down his throat, and I could see its roaming legs shift and move beneath his grossly expanded gullet. Given the way that he was moving, it was elsewhere in his body too. The mask wore an expression of a slavering hunter. Blood borrowed straight from Jay, flowed freely down its mouth, and lent it a spectral appearance. I didn't even wait for it to hit the floor before running, and when it finally caught up to me, I saw that it clanked across the floor like a four-legged spider. I threw down shelf after shelf to slow it, but it skittered over any obstacle with the wretched speed of a long-limbed arachnid. And yet, I was quicker than it around corners, and I easily kept my distance, until, finally, it disappeared from my tail. And, while I was very much terrified that it might be hiding in any one of the numerous pitch-black nooks and crannies, I deliberately turned and started for the stairs. It was waiting for me at the very top, screeching out as it raced forward. Something about his exertions had altered Jay's body. I noticed his arms and legs were swollen and bones visibly moved his skin. As it grappled with me, I understood why. To stop it reaching for my face, I had to grab Jay's arm by the wrist, desperately holding it back, except instead of holding it still, I saw that something unsheathed from the very flesh itself, sliding out from between Jay's finger bones, pushing muscle and bone aside like tenderized meat, was one of the spidery legs belonging to the mask. Horrified at the thought of it touching me, I threw the thing aside and let it tumble back down the stairs. By the time Jay's corpse had risen, more of the legs had pushed through the skin of his limbs and the cohesion of his body was giving way. The more this thing moved Jay around like a meat suit, the more it tore him apart. But at least I had a clear route to the exit and I fled to the second set of stairs, desperately hoping that this thing would be too slow. But somewhere along the way, I got lost again. And sure enough, the clicking sound of my chaser was never far behind. I'm still not sure exactly what happened, but somewhere in the basement, I passed the tunnel, or perhaps a kind of grotto. Before my brain registered the sight, and my footfall slowed to a stop, 
almost as if my brain acted without my conscious intervention. I came to a stumbling halt and glanced backwards to confirm I'd really seen what the flashing images in my mind suggested. Mr. Rittle sat at a small workspace, smiling to himself as I ran past. Good evening, he said politely when I stopped and faced him. Upon his lap was a pile of lifeless metallic legs sprayed outward like a crab's. To his left, he had placed a porcelain mask that had been delicately removed from one of the spiders. Without looking up from his work, he reached out and placed a small screw into alignment with a dozen others. Then, reaching into the machine's gut, he began to turn a large, winding handle that clicked with each jerking twist of his wrist, each rotation causing the legs to flicker with spasms of life. He looked up, only when the thing that chased me stumbled into view, stopping momentarily to glare at me, and then a Mr. Rittle. Psst, psst. Mr. Rittle chirped, as if luring a cat from some brushes. Come here now, give it up. Carefully, he patted the space beside him, and the monstrosity scuttled over and sat down in an awkward hunch. Now, he said, turning to me, something you ought to know in your profession. Sometimes it's not a hoarder's house, but rather it's a house that hoards. Some buildings don't just exist in one time or place, and they are filled with things that come from all over creation. Do you understand? Dangerous things, fun things, all of them unique. Silently, he gestured to Jay's twitching corpse. Do you have any questions? He asked. No, I said, before turning heel and running for my life. That is the first intelligent thing you've done since stepping inside this place. The old man yelled after me, his voice breaking into a bellowing chuckle. But you're not the only one who can leave. Honey, she said as she rolled over in the bed, coiling the duvet around her feet. Please come to bed. Standing with my back to her, facing the silent garden, I lit the room up with another flash of the camera and waited a few seconds to see the developed photograph. I studied it for a few seconds afterwards and then dropped it to the floor along with a hundred others. No, I said, shaking my head. I don't think I will. He was out there, getting closer with each flash. It has been a few weeks since I last saw Jay. Similarly, Penny has disappeared from the hospital. There are mixed reports on that one. I found reports that doctors and nurses who worked on his ward suffered from a spate of suicides and at least one mortician died under unusual circumstances. Speaking to an orderly, I heard that there were rumours something unusual had happened in the morgue in the early hours of the morning, and while there was nothing concrete about what that was, he confirmed that the place had been sealed off for weeks and they were using a temporary morgue set up elsewhere. But then again, there were rumours of a half-naked man in a hospital overalls running down a dual carriageway close to the house, and one doctor told me plainly that Penny had checked himself out and disappeared. Although, when asked about the suicides, that same doctor had averted her gaze and said, It was hard on all of us. I acted on a hunch and asked if she'd seen Penny during his stay. For a moment, she looked as if she might respond but then she burst into tears and refused to answer any more questions. As for me, well, I've had visits. He comes, most often at night, bearing strange things. My wife is getting irritated with the growing clutter, and right now, it's only just a few boxes and strange ornaments. I want to tell her I'll get rid of them. I want to tell her that the strange moods I've been experiencing will stop that Penny and Jay will be okay, and that any day now I'll go back to work and it'll all be normal again. But most of all, I want to tell her why any of this is happening. It's just... I don't know how. I've tried throwing these things away again, but what does it matter? 
Sometimes I still throw away the most dangerous or hard to explain things. A bloated knife, a bag of medical waste, a large packet of heroin with a pearlescent symbol. But he just brings more. All my wife sees is a plain box sitting on the doorstep. But the camera shows me that wretched figure standing expectantly over his offering. At first, I thought all he wanted was for me to keep these things. But amongst his most recent gifts was a canvas, some used and ancient brushes, and a set of unlabeled paints that stink when opened. I know what he wants. I'm losing everything. It's only just started, but I know where it's going. Bit by bit, my home is filling with the strangest things. And pretty soon, there'll be room for nothing else.